<laughs> Hello and welcome to the deepest dive from MinMax. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by a bunch of people. Uh, telepathically, let's say we have Kyle Hilliard. Hello. Grant Bullimer. Hello. Otherwise known as the chef from Min Snacks, Jeff Marchiafava. Hey. Otherwise known as Mr. Energy, and then uh, best friend Ronnie on the end there. Hello. Hello. Uh, what this is? It is the best, most thorough discussion about Final Fantasy VII remake on the internet. Um, you know, we've been saying that for a while, but after that first episode. I'm feeling really confident that this is holding true because we're taking the hive mind of the internet funneled through the Patreon, patreon.com slash minmax 2 ends. People submit comments uh, every Monday on a new chunk of the game, and then we filter it down to the best of the best. And we had 287 comments left on this Patreon post, which was an overwhelming amount. Thank you so much. And so we boiled that down, and we have a bunch of things to read off to talk about chapters 5 through 9 in the Final Woo. Fantasy VII Remake. Um, and so, uh, well, next time we're uh, trying to hope for 300. Is that right, Ben? <laughs> That's right. We're yeah. going to crack 300. 300. As, as the four people who don't have to root through the comments uh -huh. to pull good ones, give them as yeah. give us as many as you possibly can. It is fifty. It's an all day <laughs> affair, but it's a it's a good time. So, a couple of things uh, important to stress out of the gate is we are not spoiling anything after the conclusion of Chapter Nine in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Uh, first and foremost, because none of us know what's after it. Uh, also. Two of us, so Grant, well, Grant and Ronnie and I know the original game, but we're not spoiling anything from the original game either. So if this is your first time playing Final Fantasy VII, this is a safe space for you. Also, other big thing to plug is if you're watching this on YouTube and you would like this in a podcast form because you're looking at that runtime and saying, well, that's way too much time to be glued to a screen for a YouTube video, uh, you can unlock the podcast version of this and all previous Deepest Dives and get early access to the MinMax show and other bonus content, MinFacts, our weekly Q&A podcast. If you support us at the $5 tier at patreon.com slash minmax 2 ends, there's a link down below. We'd appreciate your support. And if you support us at any tier, then you can leave a comment for future chapters. Oh boy! Chapters 5 through 9. Um, these were longer than anticipated. How's everybody doing? They sure were. <laughs> Uh, uh, I I really thought that I was getting towards the end at the end of chapter eight. And I was like, okay, you know, like that, that last last chapter is probably going to be pretty quick. It seems like things are coming to a natural conclusion. Yeah. And then there's just a whole nother detour in there. Detour. Yeah, I, grand I finale. finished chapter nine like two hours ago. Like it was a sprint. Oh, <laughs> down to the wire. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I even, I even, I... I didn't, but I, I got to that point where I was going to go uh, get Aerith and see her in her dress. And they're like, hey, if you do this, you're not going to be able to do all the side quests. And I like checked my watch and I was like, you know what? I got to do those side quests. I cannot not do these things. Yeah. I can't do them. You have I mean, to. You're thank you. Walmart is not a place to skip either. That's no. those are fun, those are fun yeah. side quests. I got it. Got it. Moving on. Got it. Um, Ronnie, <laughs> yeah. you seem to be extremely stressed out about this whole thing to the point of. <laughs> well, no, you. I, was just, I was just angry at you. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> and I was in the camp of like, well, I don't want to be too much of a dick, but you said you did the deepest dive. And if we lost you for the second discussion, I would be heartbroken. I think the community would be heartbroken. So thank you for powering through. Yeah, no, no, it was uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Actually, uh, on Sunday, I was just powering through chapter eight and that one kind of left me a little bit exhausted. Uh, but by the end of chapter nine, last night at 1 a.m., um, I applauded by myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect you gave yourself a little uh high five like this and you did not take a long time to build up okay so yeah, chapter I, I during the dance sequence i assume is when you were clapping right we'll get to that yeah. no actually it was uh when corneo was at his creepiest ronnie stood up and gave him a slow <laughs> clap really into it uh okay so we got so many comments uh this is my favorite game to play what do you think was the most commented upon thing during this section uh was it comments asking for Ron to grow a Corneo mustache. <laughs> that was, That's okay, right. no, number two. On. What do you got? Most common comment. I mean, it's got to be the dress stuff, right? Like just putting Cloud in a dress and no. the whole dance sequence. No. And like, oh, no. Excuse me. Oh, oh I, I would have guessed the dance sequence it was by not. a mile. You know the guesses? Uh, is it a freaky hand massage from uh, Madam M? Oh. Close, <laughs> close, but no cigar. Ah. Uh, number one comment was... Aerith dialogue. Number oh, two yeah. comment was that fucking hell house. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. People <laughs> lost. Oh my god, that was so exciting. That was so exciting. Okay, there's a lot to unpack. Uh, okay. okay, most ignored things. Like going through all these comments, trying to figure out what people are writing in about for their most insightful, specific feedback. What stood out to them? 
There's one of those things of going through, and I know it wasn't a big scene, but no one mentioned Scarlet. Nobody mentioned uh, <laughs> Madame M's personality. They mentioned other features. Oh. No one mentioned, uh, let's see, Plan E. No one mentioned Smoggers. I was waiting for that Smoggers feedback. Uh, wait, wait, Smoggers? Those were those the side quests in Chapter 8, those big, like, pumping machines. Oh, yeah, they were, were kind of annoying. Real but... turds mm. down by Spit the water. Black smoke at you. They put you in silence too. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I I get it. I just I don't know why that would be. I'm just listing things that were. Was... What I'm thinking anyone... about, like the important words during my play session, smoggers is at least number twenty seven. So I was expecting it to come up. Uh, and then did no... anyone point out that the uh, the villains are basically Snoke? Like that, just the way they have the giant holograms, like in the no, when they're oh. talking no one you? did, no one did, uh, and nobody mentioned uh, the squats. One really? person mentioned the leaders at Jules, um, but no one yeah. mentioned the squats. Wait, they know the squats guy's name is Ronnie. Well, right? there was like, the other guy, Ronnie. Congratulations on yeah. making the cut, making it in the game, yeah. Ronnie. Wait, I mean, we got Hanson are you in there. That... We got Ronnie in there. We're, we're doing good. And nobody think... commented on that. <laughs> Ronnie was the one that just fell over and didn't get back up. I think during the squat yeah, challenge, breathing right? heavily. He was, he was the first guy that had. A lot of ego and uh, no talent. I like the idea of him like <laughs> training for just years at this gym doing squats, and his coach is trying to be as positive as possible. Jules like, you got it. Keep at it, Ronnie. And he does three squats and just... No, I'm going seven. Seven. <laughs> seven. <laughs> I mean, I mean like, we all like tripled the score, right? Like no problem. Oh, just well, annihilated. Yeah. Double. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what about... Wait, hang on, Kyle. Did you, did you go for the pro? Did you get that champion's belt? No, dude, I was sprinting like three hours ago <laughs> trying to finish the game. Why sprint so when you can not. squat? So you, you didn't get the champion's belt? No, I didn't get the champion's belt. <laughs> oh, okay. So you're not a squat champion. I'm sorry, I'm not. And it's pro I probably can't go back now to, to squat to my heart. No, back. you can't. Nope. Here we go. It's the... It's a really good belt. No, too. Hanson, we want to focus That's... on this as much as possible. We got, believe it or not, a lot to get through, Kyle. Um, hey, here's a here's a broad one. Steve Bam Dead. Thank you for support, Steve. Says this definitely feels like a really good adaptation of an HBO miniseries adaptation of the Midgar section of the original Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mark Miller says, I really appreciate the moments of levity this game provides. My main takeaway, however, is they have done a great job with the pacing so far. The flow of the emotions, battles, bosses, and side quests all feel really well done. Any feedback on the pacing for chapters five through nine? I, I would agree with that. I, I feel like it's I'm consistently doing something interesting. I guess some of the side quests are kind of dull. Like that might be the one place where it's like, but I, I, it's hard to complain about that because they are optional. You know, but I just insist on doing yeah. it. Well, yeah. Well, I've also heard, I, I don't know if this is true, but that, like, if you do all the side quests, generally you're going to be rewarded by something in the game. And so it's kind of like one of those things where, well, if you want to consume all of it, you probably should do that stuff. And so it, it, it isn't, like, totally optional if you want to see everything. Well... You know, I was really frustrated by so many, like there were comments on uh, last week's video talking about the opening and how I didn't find the last cat during that side quest. I'm like, oh, whatever. I don't want to do the cat. And everyone's saying, oh, you're missing the Tifa scene. You're missing the Tifa scene. So I reloaded chapter three and played through that again. So I've gone through like chapters three and four so many times now, um, but did that again just to get that Tifa scene and loved it. I'm so glad I did it. Um, yeah. And so now I'm just paranoid that if I don't do every side quest, yeah. I'm going to be missing out on huge things, even though somebody was telling me from the Mid Max community that like, oh, with this one, you're not going to miss out on too much if you don't do absolutely everything. But, but that's subjective. I mean, uh, yeah, like my question is about like chapter eight, like if you didn't do all of the side quests in chapter eight, did you get that last little part where you were uh, talking with with Aerith like in the garden? Uh, yes, I believe so. So I, I believe would, this, I would assume so. The side uh, quests. Okay. Uh, impact a lot of things like the dresses everybody has and stuff but we get a breakdown of that coming up later here uh travis manick is a smart person and uh he wrote in saying the summon fights are fun but the vr aspect i know that we're jumping ahead a little bit but it'll tie back i promise uh the vr aspect feels like a missed opportunity why not have a bigger side quest line that ends with fighting or helping shiva then when you then you aren't fighting in a computer and you aren't killing rats for side quests which you know amateur game design of course but it's one of those things like yeah it is weird that there's like ah, oh, the summon fights uh effin chadley is going to be in charge of that and then the side quest is going to be you killing a toad with a crown on its head <laughs> you know it's like why not try and pull that well, out because then they'd have to come up with like narratives for every uh summit right and it's like i don't 
I, I saw the fat chocobo. I didn't attempt him yet, but like, I don't. Do I need a story about why there's a fat chocobo like in the main line of the game? I don't know. I don't. I don't really mind that there's just a list that I can go unlock them if I want. You know. Yeah. There is a book you should read called The Fat Chocobo. <laughs> it's about 340 pages long. Uh, That's okay. really good. Now, Ronnie hasn't <laughs> submitted his first draft yet, but I think it's on the desk next to you, Ronnie. If you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it is, and it, I think you're, I think that's a good point, Kyle. Because then it's like, okay, well, if you have Shiva in Chapter Eight, then it's like, what's she going to be hanging out down by the pond? Like, I'm the Lord of Ice by this pond. Like, I'm sure they care Help so much me. about the world. <laughs> Get this toad off of me! <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Did nonsense. you guys try to fight her a bunch as Cloud by yourself first and fail, and then I did it I, once or twice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, no, I thought I, that's I, how it was going to work, and then and then when I went in with Aerith, it was like, oh, okay, this is much easier. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that I was. I just called. I threw in the talent. I was like, you know what? I think I can do this with Aerith. I'm just going to wait till she comes back, and it made it like totally doable at that point. Yeah, Derek. Now, Mull- I, I'm looking at the silent confidence of Grant, and I'm going to say that he did it just with Claude alone. I don't remember, to be honest. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, That's someone who did it but doesn't want to brag. Is yeah. What that is. Uh, for Humble. shorthand, uh, Grant's good at all video games that he plays. Um, oh. And he's good at cooking. Um, I assume he's a great kisser. Unconfirmed. Uh, Bring it in. Derek Maldonado <laughs> says, I didn't, re- <laughs> I didn't realize you could fight Shiva with Aerith in Chapter 8 and went into the fight after dropping her off at home. And I must say, fighting that boss alone really taught me about combat in this game and made every battle so much easier after that. I love that idea, Derek, of just like forcing yourself to do it. Because I got my ass kicked a couple times by Shiva and I was like, you know what? I could drain all my items here, but I'll just wait for Aerith. Got her, tried one time and just like barely lost. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wait till I have three in my party. No big deal. And uh, I've never regretted a decision more because then it turns out there's a fire-based giant boss coming up that kicked my ass. So I really regret not getting her when I could have. Uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of had that, that same um, feeling where I did the fight just with Cloud and I thought like, wow, this, like, this is so difficult. And I, and I love when games do that where they say like, you can, you can do this if you want to. You really don't have to right now, but it is doable right now. And so I, I thought it was a great test to see how how well I was grasping the combat. Yeah, and you did it. Yep. Uh, Andrew Valla says, What's up with Sir Chad's a lot synthesizing summons materia? That seems like a weird mechanic to introduce godlike entities when you can acquire summons materia elsewhere in the game. Well, you know, he's a powerful being. He has to <laughs> harness gods and put it in his VR world. So I haven't found any anywhere. Are they just in the environment and I miss them? Or... Yes. There was one, yeah. Yeah, there was one. Oh, so what I'm confused sad. about is because I haven't beat any of the VR simulations yet, is it like a one-two thing to unlock it, or is it an either-or? Like you can find it in the environment, or you could uh, beg mm. Chadsley for a god. We don't. We don't know yet, right? Well, I don't understand. Oh, because I think I think Chadley has his own, and then you can probably. Find, I mean, what's the one that you find in the environment? It was a fat chocobo. Uh, oh, you, oh, you did. Regular chocobo. Well, it was oh. Chocobo and Mog, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah Chocobo yeah. and Mog. Okay, okay, so they're all then, which different, is different than the one in the VR. Yeah, oh, okay. right. Yeah. Okay. Totally different than Fat Chocobo. <laughs> gotcha. It's a pretty it's a regular healthy Chocobo. That's right. Uh, Pseudonymous Joe says, super specific, but when Cloud put on those derpy VR goggles, I immediately thought of Kai Lang from Mass Effect 3. Uh, yeah, I saw that was Giant Bomb's thumbnail a while back. Was that picture of Cloud wearing the VR goggles? And I was like, oh no, does Cloud like go blind in this game or something? I was so <laughs> up in my head about what I was looking at. Uh, and Caleb Murray says, uh, I summoned Ifrit during the Shiva fight and uh, Shiva versus Ifrit is extremely cool. That uh, was amazing. Yes, it's very yeah. fun to see that. Uh, also, I liked in that fight too when I had Aerith. Like everybody just has kind of their their lines in combat, their barks, which you're pretty used to at this point, but I love that Aerith, as I'm fighting Shiva, she's like, let him have it! And I was like, well, it's clearly a woman, but you know what, I guess the majority <laughs> of enemies in this game are men, so we'll go, go along with it. Aerith doesn't see gender. I, I guess that's true. Yeah. I, I also really like the fact that when you are, in terms of the summoning mechanics, that any of your party members can use, you can use their ATB in order yeah. to, to use their abilities. Yeah. So you, yeah, you can just, nice. you can really spam those attacks sometimes yeah, when they're out. Yeah, it really helps out. And that's super satisfying, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to get back to uh, some broad stuff over the top, because uh, we always like broad stuff over the top, um, Darren wrote in, old buzzkill Darren, 
He says, after really enjoying the first four chapters, chapters five through nine felt like the cracks in the game started to become more noticeable. The level design felt a little uninspired throughout most of these chapters, and the dialogue and voice acting have been hit or miss. I'm still enjoying the remake, and most of these issues are pretty mild, but they're still a bit annoying at times. What about just like general temperature from folks? How are you feeling about chapters five through nine? I I agree. Uh, I'm still really enjoying the game, liking it more and more. But they're like uh, when you're with Tifa and Barrett, kind of running down the hallways. Like those just felt like long, kind of boring hallways. Like the, the the sort of level design really fell apart. And then also, that's the you get out onto the uh, I don't know all the terms, but like when you're way up high in the sky on top of the yeah. things, and you look down, the texture on the ground looked really rough. Well, here we and go. That was the fir- and that was the first time I was kind of like, oh, okay, everything has looked so amazing up until this point, but this is the first time, I, I, like they said, you're starting to see the cracks a little bit. Well, Damon and Andrew Valla here uh, both heard, and Damon said that some of the JPEG quality backgrounds are really jarring, and Andrew Valla said he used to do testing for AAA games, and he says some of those background textures are astoundingly bad, especially during storytelling moments. It's hard not to be taken out of the experience during an emotional scene when Aerith... During an emotional scene with Aerith while a muddy N64 booger flower sways in the backdrop. Yeah. Uh, I took yeah. a screenshot of yeah. that and I was like, oh, this must be a fun reference to the PS1 game, these flowers. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I mean, I think the game is so unbelievably good looking that the fact that like, yeah, they're not going to render out just a huge slum. Like, of course, they got to have some texture for that background. It's just way too much detail to go into for the PS4. It's like it it was noticeable at the same time the rest of the game looks so unbelievably good that it's like accepted. I'm not yeah, I'm not well, angry. Yeah, I'm being a little bit yeah. of an apologist here. Do you think? Like, uh, yeah, I think so. I- like, they, if they want it to be like maintain that visual quality that they like have initially, like I think it's okay to complain that other elements are not great. You know, I, I mean, I think they're pushing this hardware as far as it can possibly go. Like, what else? Uh, what other option do they have? Not my problem. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> to quote Jeff Cork. Damn it! I, I, I agree with uh, Kyle. Those flowers were inexcusable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I must be looking at the character models more because they, I guess, they didn't notice what's going on in the background. Yeah, I mean, definitely the, I mean, the city was was noticeable for sure. But at the same time, having that moment of like the first time, at least for me, is like when you're on a ladder there and then it's like, holy God, like you can see the entire slums below me. That impact is worth it. Even then, once you poke around the edges, you're like, OK, it's an image. Yeah, but still. I mean, to be clear, I know I'm coming off as negative, but like I'm still really overall just visually constantly impressed with how this game looks. It's just those little moments where I'm just kind of like, oh, that looks kind of rough. But then it's like you look at Cloud again and you're like, oh, well, this, that, that doesn't matter. It's stunning, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'd like to just go back a little bit and just hear from actually like everybody about like where they are temperature-wise in terms of the chapters five through nine. Like, Kyle, it kind of sounds like you were like, like, yeah, it's still, still good, waning a little bit. Like, Grant, what do you slightly, think? Slightly, very slightly, but still sure. really having a great time, yeah. Uh, I think of this section, eight was the one that probably was my least favorite out of the bunch. You also um, played it multiple times, right? I did. Eight, eight was where I had to restart. Um, ah, uh, yeah. And redoing all those side quests, eh, just I got, I got a little tired of it by that time. Uh, but chapter nine really brought me back around. Yeah, and I've I've been enjoying everything. I think. Some of some of the interactions with Aerith were not the best, and I, I think Cut that's his mic. <laughs> <laughs> gotta go. Her, her character in those relationships. I, I do want to hear what everyone has to say about what her character is like in the original and things like that. Um, but gameplay wise, I've the combat has just gotten better and better, and right. And I, I actually when he when the previous. Uh, comment that you were reading was talking about how some of the environments were were kind of boring and stuff. I, I had actually written out that in that first, like the subway area, I was actually impressed that there was a sense of place to everywhere that you were going. Like, I, like all of the environments, it didn't just feel like a linear dungeon, even though that's that's essentially what it was functioning as. There was enough detail and different machines and things like that that it actually it had a better sense of place than I was expecting. So yeah, I actually absolutely enjoyed the yeah the, I like a little I th- bit more. I think my takeaway is like I remember when we played the demo for the first time for the Great Goaty Hunt, I believe Jeff um, and I think you asked me at the end of that like what stood out, and I said oh what stood out to me is like 
the lasers in the opening of like timing going through those lasers in chapter one. Cause like, that's mm -hmm. like a weird gameplay thing. And that's what I want to know how they're doing in the remake is just padding things out and padding's a bad word, but you know, just actually putting just some weird basic gameplay in here. And I feel like chapters five through nine give a better sense of like, Oh, this is what remakes dungeons look like. This is what remakes bizarre moving claw hand cargo container segments look like just like these basic ass video game mechanics to try mm -hmm. and tell the full story and let you soak this in a little bit. And so that is a bigger realization is just, okay, that's what they're doing here. And then also story moments maybe even hit me harder uh, in this section than the first, which I wasn't expecting. At the same time, uh, where I see the cracks forming for me a little bit is in the combat. Like I was more frustrated by combat in this section uh, than I was in the first, just... Maybe it's a matter of understanding it better and understanding the limitations of it a little bit more, but uh, that's where I'm at. But Ronnie, where are you at? You wanted to form a church uh, for this game in the first section. Yeah, I'm expanding the church. <laughs> <laughs> Business is a moment. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, I think my lowest point was probably chapter uh, five. Yeah. Five chapter is the train five. tunnel one, yeah. Yeah, and just... Uh, well, wait a second. Yeah, train tunnel and then into um, like the top of the plate. Or Six is turning off turning. the suns. Yeah, yeah. And, and, off. Gonna get lost yeah. Up there. yeah. yeah and, and that didn't feel good to me. Uh, that, that, was, that, that was my least favorite chapter by, I think, a, a pretty significant margin. And then um, eight rolled around and I, I liked it a lot more. Uh, but then again, I, I also thought like, I, I kind of did this. Um, and then nine uh, came by and just blew me out of the goddamn water <laughs> okay so, so you say you already did it in eight you're just talking about like the first like the sector seven yeah. slums it's like okay how different are the sector five slums really which they are i mean yeah. like one of the cool things about you know it, it, when we were talking about just like how much we have left in chapters eight and nine uh one thing i just like refuse to do is, is skimp on just like soaking all this in and they are different um but i think just like the format between eight and four or three, eight and three are, are, are very similar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you guys want to work chronologically? How are you feeling? What mood are yeah. you all in? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. I, like, I like chronological. Perfect. One, la one last little snippet on the pacing of this. Yeah. Considering that in the original game, this entire portion of this game takes nine hours to play, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that this is a 40-hour game for them to add that much additional content and still have it be like this rewarding and, inter and interesting is really a credit to how much work they put into this. It's, it's pretty amazing. It is mind boggling. I mean, we'll get into the details later on, but just like so many moments in this game where it's like, not only are they not rewriting the original, they're taking small aspects of the original and just making it. I mean, it's like taking, I don't know. This is dumb. I don't know. It, it's, it's like taking this tiny part of our childhood and then just giving it the biggest presentation you could possibly imagine. It just feels like somebody carting out this long lost toy on like this golden pedestal. And it's like, what? All right. I love it. I didn't expect you to come back, but yep, I'm here for it. Right. And, and I'm also turning into a kid as this is happening because it's like <laughs> as, as you said, Ben, uh, I think last time it's like the nerds have won. And I, I think I like I thought that like three or four times during this like chapters five through nine yeah yeah like over and over again just like the fan service like the the, the house coming out <laughs> and we'll get to that <laughs> but my god like that's unbelievable uh, unbelievable yeah okay so but yeah i was going through my notes again and i noticed that the one word i keep writing over and over again is amazing we're just like yeah, this scene yeah. is amazing this music transition is amazing that attention to detail is amazing uh, yeah, this I remake wrote down, is amazing. Uh, Tifa dresses as a dead or alive cowgirl at one point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a powerful scene. We'll get into all this stuff. <laughs> she went through a phase for a while. There. It was weird. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, Scott Castro, chapter five is where we're at. He says, wouldn't it make more sense from a Shinra security standpoint if the ID scans didn't announce when false ideas are identified? <laughs> Just post additional security at the next station. Seems like drones flying in and breaking the windows <laughs> and announcing the presence of false ideas is a more dangerous move for the general public. Yeah, well, I they mean, still have Heidegger as the head of security. So <laughs> what are you going to do? Oh, is this thing I mean, on? Oh, oh, oh. I mean, Shinra's <laughs> like, one of their security measures is like, 
three people having to pull levers. Like, <laughs> that doesn't stop anybody. There's no, you don't have to say so who it's you not are. Working. <laughs> uh, Ron, did you, did you make it past the lever sequence, though? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because yes, you're a real hotshot, uh, ready to time me for the lever sequence in the original, or roughly like the equivalent <laughs> of the lever sequence. Because in the original, there's like a section where it's like you have to bang on a thing with all three characters right. at the same time, and this it's kind of what this section I think was like harkening back to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Well, I just remember like when we were kids, you um, you cried. <laughs> Shut that up, you idiot! <laughs> I did not. You guys, I did not. Um, Let's see, Swanky Orc, if you want to jump ahead, here we go. Uh, it says, anyone else, anyone else fail miserably at the synchronized lockstep sequence before the airbuster fight? It took me multiple attempts, and each time I'd mess up, Tifa would get frustrated while Barry would try to motivate us by coming up with some ridiculous song about Seventh Heaven. I really like that Square took the time to add small details even when I failed. Uh, and Zixirium, I did like that Barrett kept trying to take control, and Tifa was like, no, no, just... Let me take care of it. I'll yeah. do it. <laughs> Follow but, me, not Barrett. <laughs> but I love yeah. that Barrett was also like, okay, like you're in charge. Like he wasn't yeah, being yeah. too pissy with no, her. He's yeah. like, oh, clearly she's the she's the brains of this operation. She's uh, the, love, the lover master. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, but you can't but to get to the comment, I totally blew it, and I don't I don't understand what I was doing wrong. <laughs> why why it would not click? It's it's such a simple command. And it was like, what the hell does she want from me? I'm <laughs> pressing the things and the arrows when she says to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Zexerium says, oh my god, I just want to take this opportunity to describe how much I hated the door puzzle right before you fight Airbuster. It took me way too long, like 15 minutes for both of them? Hell, it took me longer than the fight itself. And then the comment of Tifa in the end saying, yes, you guys, we still got it! Even though I love this remake and it's everything I wanted it to be. I love that, like, when you <laughs> do that door puzzle thing, then finally Barrett goes, take that, Shinra, making us jump through hoops to steal your shit. <laughs> 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 Uh, so that's that very specific section. Let's I, see. I, I, you know, I also... Puzzle. Are, are we just talking about, like, the lovers, or...? Yeah. yeah. It, it wasn't a puzzle. Yeah, it wasn't really a puzzle. <laughs> but for some reason, it was, it was a difficult. security measure. It was very clearly a security measure. The solution is on the screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you mean, push it in the like direction of the arrow? <laughs> yeah. Impossible. Uh, I, I also like in that section that they... It seems like they're giving you a side quest to go get to go get all the items that you had dump out yeah and it's literally just doing it on the other computer and then you walk right through that door and you get them and it's like side quest done good job <laughs> <laughs> i mean the game yeah. overall in this section especially i feel like is is being a good modern 2020 game and maybe that's going to annoy some people i haven't seen too many people write in complaining about it but just in terms of letting you know like hey you might be missing something or like hey don't go that way like even you know in chapter five uh in like the tunnels and stuff there's so much talk about like oh we got to follow the nose follow the nose you got to follow yeah, stamps oh, did, puzzle. did you know you were supposed to follow stamps nose but it's, 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 that... it's like it's like i was trying to go off the track to find hidden material or treasure chest and it's like yeah it's just running down a tunnel like there's no maze whatsoever here but the way that the dialogue is coming across makes it mm. seem like it's the lost woods or something you know <laughs> right uh yeah that oh gone. i refuse to go on without you <laughs> uh it, yeah that, I, th I think that was you know, as I kind of said before, is like this was like its first example of just like oh, it's kind of a dungeon here, and <laughs> it was it was very linear, and um, I I had fun with the fights, but like overall, I was like get on with it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, I didn't. Sure. Time bomb, Tom. So you were like get on with it. I was like get on with it. <laughs> I see now. <laughs> so time bomb Tom says testament to Tifa's character as she saved that Shinra employee on the train even though he tells her that he is the bad guy and she saves him anyway this is a nice little Tifa moment let's pay off for the middle manager to come back uh, um what <laughs> uh Tifa I, I feel like I, so this was one thing that I saw in chapter 5 a little bit but this like split between like Tifa being like kind of this light light hearted you know, a person that's like imitating the president and like yeah. one part of the the game, but then also just like really struggling with the idea that she's going to bomb like a, a public place, and and those two things didn't like I was confused there. I they didn't fit very well for me. Don't you think she's just kind of nervous and kind of even when she yeah. was jokey, trying to take her mind off it a little bit? Maybe like Barrett was kind of channeling his 
nerves about the whole thing into being a little bit sillier in this chapter and Tifa was kind of doing the same? Yeah, I, I, I do. And I, I think, I, I think that will be a, a small grievance in the, in the uh, larger scheme of things, because I think this is going to be an ongoing theme for Tifa. And so they're just sort of planting the seed right now. Um, so it's, it's just the beginning, but yeah, oh, well, I, I think so far it's, it's kind of like, man, there are two very different things going on with Tifa right now. Yeah. Uh, Taylor Owens, uh, wrote in to let us know. He says, did you know that Tifa is hot? Uh, no, he oh. says, he does say that, but then he says, but aside from a few combat comments of working up a sweat or needing a shower, she isn't sexualized the way that Cindy in 15 or quiet Miller solid five was despite of kind oh, of yeah. being the OG of thirst JRPG characters. I feel like it's one of the mini game, many ways this game is listening to criticisms from previous Square Enix overall. And like, there's a couple, I think for Tifa and Aerith, there's a couple shots where to like start on their boobs and move out, but it's pretty subtle. And like overall for this section in particular, it was a lot of like, oh boy, Square Enix. I'm like, okay, actually pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. It, it, it could have been worse. <laughs> Brought up to Larry worse. David and all of us. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, go on. Uh, for going to like a weird strip club and all kinds of massage things and the cross dressing for and just I guess wall market in general kind of they I think they handled all of that much better than I was worried they were going to. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, so uh, Barton Summers here. Uh, this is real quick and no 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 spoilers. He said, "What did you think? Uh, what did you think Tifa meant when she said that the smell of Mako in Mako Reactor Five brought her back?" Did I miss something? Has she and Avalanche blown up some reactors before? Uh, Jeff um, and Kyle, any clue what was going on there? I mean, I, without any larger knowledge, obviously, I just took it as like a story that will be expanded on later. I mean, Cloud had that flashback where, like I said, she was dressed as a cowgirl for some reason. Yeah. And it looked like she was like in the reactor. So I, I just kind of took that as a seed being planted. Interesting. Very perceptive, Kyle. Good job. Yeah. Oh. You passed the test. Jeff um, do you want to yeah. submit your answer? No, I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to see you after class, and uh, we're a little bit disappointed. Um, Yaro uh, says, I love seeing that Barrett had a fear of heights in Chapter 6. Him going, yeah. <laughs> no fear, no fear, no fear, little fear, when going across the fan platforms was hilarious. Then when you get off, he says, took a couple years off my life, uh, I mean a couple seconds, three tops. Uh, and then Steven says, Did anyone else notice... Did anyone else's opinion of Barrett change in this section? From the banter in the tunnels to the fact that he sang the Final Fantasy fanfare a few times in Chapter 7, I thought he came off as much more likable uh, during Chapters 5, 6, and 7. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I I I kind of always feel like Barrett's in this place where he's he's kind of a kid, like just with a gun for an arm. You know, (laughs) I don't don't think he thinks through things as as much as he should. Um, And so this kind of like highlights his overall just kind of happy-go-lucky nature well it's funny you say that because even like there's that line too where he's talking about when you're running around in the um in the sun dungeon i guess we'll call it um but when he's running up around up there he mentions uh how he loves reading life in the endless maze this book to his daughter marlene and he's like and i do all the voices ah ha ha you know it's like he does be so much more jokey and i guess kid like maybe that's why he gets along with marlene is you're saying he's (laughs) has the same mentality as marlene her her approach to the world where you blow stuff up or you smile well i think the reason why he's just like so lighthearted and, and can get the other people other avalanche members like through those tough times is that he's he doesn't get weighted down by these thoughts of like hey like yeah we killed a lot of people but check out this gun arm you know? <laughs> so you're saying he's a <laughs> sociopath <laughs> well kind of I, like, I, I i i do think that there's this like a lack of like forethought on his but on like on his part, it just kind of puts him in this, in this kind of weird place of like, you do know that you're like committing acts of terrorism that are causing casualties I while th- singing da 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 <laughs> da 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 da, you know, like. Which, by the way, my kid thought that there. was my kid thought that was like the 20th century uh, Fox fanfare logo. She was like, "Why is he singing that thing that's at the beginning of movies?" <laughs> Well, she's used to Kingdom Hearts. It's all just some confusing crossover. They're owned by Disney now. Um, Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Thinking about that section, too, I think it did a much better job of kind of showing how nervous everybody was. There are so many references in chapters five, six, and seven about, like, you know, 
we might not make it out of this thing or like, hey, we actually all made it. Hey, we're all still alive. It seems like everyone's very aware that like Avalanche is a risky thing and it's kind of a miracle that they've made it as far as they have, right? Whereas in the first right. chunk, they finished the bombing run and everyone's like, woohoo, let's crack a beer. We killed people. You know, whereas this one, it's more like we're actually still getting away with this, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, also, Barry, everybody seems scared except for Biggs who just jumps off of a ledge with a grappling hook like it's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently it is no big deal. We'll get into that later, too. Uh, but also, I love in this chapter, uh, chapter five with Barrett, that he does say, ain't no stopping this train we're on, sun. He adds the sun, which is nice. Um, and I love, like, before the Airbuster fight, how cocky he is, how delighted he is that this is how Shinra is going to try and stop him and how easily they'll crush him. And then he asks, like, everybody else if they want to dance with him. He's just so over the moon about, like, this is their plan? Really? It's very fun. But also that he's going to get an op- uh, like an opportunity to have a public platform. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then he's, like, nervous as he's, like, getting ready to talk and stuff. Practicing yeah. the speech. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Even, uh, I'm sorry, Evan Plumley says his TV speech rehearsals seemed like a tonal shift for the character and it made me chuckle. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the Shinra strategy here overall, very confusing for <laughs> how to assassinate these terrorists. I, I, I kind of like, I, I was thinking a lot about just the ineptitude of, uh, Shinra right now and, uh, Heidegger, like in particular at how just like, he just kind of like looks like an artifact of the past. Like, like he probably rose to, to power in Shinra, like during the war and now he's head of public security and, it's not a one-to-one fit. That's the way that I've been interpreting it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they had to reward him for something. And they're like, yeah, that's yeah. Right. be all right. And right. Now, now he's just a warmonger, I think they call him. But Nicholas Freitas says, I love that Heidegger is a hybrid of a real character, but also uh, the big oaf with a dumb horse laugh. And Andrew Wallace says, does anyone else hate how one note and stereotypical, blustering, beefy, bad guy Heidegger is? We've been treated to great character development so far, and this bloated, bloated bastard is just so uninspired. What modern day antagonist sud- constantly guffaws like that? I'd take Rose over this buffoon any day. He is a, uh, he's very, I saw Alex Grenling, uh, friend of the show, mentioned him on last week's episode too, but I saw him on Twitter talk about how it's very Ocelot. They'd have like him on his very sweet looking phone being like, yes, sir. You got it, Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Yeah. President. Like, it's literally, literally yeah. saying that. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild. I also like, I also like when that call happened, like he, he called the smartphone of just like one of the henchmen. And he's like, it's for you, sir. It's like, who, who are you call? Like <laughs> whose phone did the president call? And why is he handing <laughs> it over like that? And it literally says the president. <laughs> yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I got to take this. This one's important. Remember that Scarlet uh, scene where she's talking about the damage after the Airbuster fight. And then that, she just hey, starts. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah. I, I, I want to unpack that. But I, but I do think that Heidegger's one dimensionality, like, like serves a broader purpose. Which is? Um, yet to be determined. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're out of your mind. I, I, could see, I could see him expanding more in the future. Though. I, 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 I think, think, yeah. yeah I, I, yes. They're, they're, they're I mean, a, I a don't point. think, there's not layers of Heidegger to go here. No, there's not. But I think that's, I think that's going to serve a purpose later on. No, we're going to go to his house. We're going to meet his mom. You know, <laughs> we're going to... And I can't We're wait. Gonna pile uh, furniture in the stairway at the end of the night to go to bed. Oh, perfect! God damn. It. <laughs> I also did want to say that it, as as dumb, you know, and short sighted as they are, thinking that they can just stop the heroes with a giant robot that they've been when they've been blowing up robots the entire time. I did like the the kind of hearts and mind argument, and that that to me was an interesting twist when they show. All the different people in all the slums saying, hey, these guys are terrorists. Like, stop bombing stuff. Yeah. And, it, and there's that kind of moment of realization for the entire crew. Of, and I think Tifa even says, like, oh, so we're screwed now. Like, like they can they can blow up all the robots they want. But if they're still being seen as the bad guys, then what's the end game for their plan here? Yeah. And that was some, interesting to me. There's some line from an NPC at some point in the city where they're like, you know how long it took to make that reactor? <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah <laughs> right. I bet it's probably like you and your family were out there laying bricks to create a mock reactor. It's wild. But what were you going to say about uh, Scarlet? Oh, it was a really um, insightful point. I was going to say, wasn't it weird when she walked towards the camera and then the camera guy fell down? It was intimidating, yeah. man. 
I don't like, want to mess with her. But like when, <laughs> when, come on, somebody in the government walks towards you and you're a cameraman, you're so intimidated, you're like, whoa, just fall over like you're doing squats well, out there. If you're oh, doing like the, if you're doing like the panty shot angle too that he was doing, you know, you can't walk <laughs> squat backwards as it's true they're coming towards you that's so. true uh, I, I actually thought that that he she like kicked him down oh really we'll have to check the uh, tape maybe i'm yeah maybe i'm wrong on that. Uh, check the tapes yeah beaten down brian says during chapter five there's a small interaction between the group that i wanted to call attention to it happens just before you encounter the mutated insect spider enemies for the first time uh, and it goes a little something like this tifa oh boy there's a lot of characters here i can't impersonate them so tifa says what's that and barrett says nothing good Tifa says, guys, I think it might be a nest. Barrett says, all kinds of creepy crawlies make themselves at home in the plate. Then they get even more messed up by the Mako. Tifa says, Mako did this? Barrett says, no, not Mako, Shinra. Cloud says, that black and white world of yours. And Barrett says, you like it, huh? You know there's room for one more. And then Cloud sarcastically says, I'll think about it. Uh, He says, to me, that one interaction does a great job of encapsulating the overall quality of the writing dialogue in this game. It highlights the ways in which they're fleshing out small details of the world, as well as capturing the personalities of each character. Tifa's compassion, Barrett's brashness, Cloud's cockiness. Although a minor moment, it was one that stood out, emphasizing a lot of what is making this remake so special for me so far. Well said, Brian. Um, Yeah, there's even like those little jokes about, you know, like, oh, maybe you won't make Marlene uh, scared this time, Cloud. And then he's like, well, that'll cost you to smile for marlene or something and like he made a joke that made like tifa laugh it's like okay cloud's starting to melt a little bit he apparently stiffens up and then melts completely later but his arc is all over the place for this section I, yeah i, I kind of like that that like as barrett and cloud would spend time together that they're kind of hitting stride in some way um it, it's it's not hostile anymore it, it just kind of seems like they they have a little bit of a um it's the right word for it. Uh, competition, friendly competition kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Y- yeah, they've got that competition. <laughs> they're like not friends, but they're kind of friends. I don't know. We got like it. We got it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, David Letterman. Yeah, once, about that. <laughs> David Letterman once said, he said, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer, but your frenemies in between. <laughs> and I think those are wise words we can all hold true to. Anyways, yeah, I don't get it. Yeah, Nicholas Fredo says, hey, I spent <laughs> over an hour uh, backtracking through the entire subway tunnel looking for the infinite Shinra guard spawn from the original game, and I'm slightly disappointed to report that it is omitted from the remake. I loved grinding on that infinite spawn to get everyone level two limit breaks. The trains that randomly go by during chapter five will do their best uh, to not be on the same track the player is on, by the way. But if you're fast enough, you can run into the train and clip right through it. <laughs> I was uh, wondering how that worked. That's interesting. I Yeah, somebody else said that they uh, S their pants every time that one of those trains went by. Because like, especially with headphones on, it's like, oh my god. It's intense. Grimfeather wrote in saying, I really enjoyed the small character animation details in Chapter 6, such as the way Cloud methodically, almost delicately, crosses the gaps and the cat walks under the plate. And the fact that Tifa does not hesitate to be the first one to hop onto the pipe to sl- so- to slide slurf <laughs> oh no <laughs> uh, uh, to be the first one to hop onto the pipe to slide surf her way down mm. you know um, do, does everyone remember the, the when she hopped that... on the pipe to slide surf <laughs> down yeah I, I remember slide slurfing but... <laughs> it doesn't sound it doesn't sound any better the second time around <laughs> hopping, on, hopping on that pipe uh, <laughs> But uh, yes, uh, those are those are good moments to to call out Grimfeather. Uh, the, the part that struck me on that was that Barrett is scared of heights. Fifteen minutes ago, you know, no fear, no fear, no fear. Yeah. Okay, little fear, and then no hesitation is jumping on that pipe, the slide <laughs> circuit, like it's nothing. He loves sliding. Yeah. He just hates ladders. I think is how it works. Uh, okay. Also, in that section, I believe it's that section. There's some moment here. I believe it's in this chapter where. You're just running around the environment. You go around. It's like, okay, dead end over here. And then one of those cutters, like the big robots, like cuts through in real time this wall mm-hmm. right in front of you. And it looks unbelievably good. And the fact that that's not a cut scene, that it happens like in game, I was blown away by. Uh, Adam Moran is getting to the whole hanging dungeon thing. He says, I thought it was a really cool way and a really cool... <clears throat> He says it much more eloquently. He says, I thought it was really cool to go through what was effectively a dungeon set high up above the slums. And honestly, it's so dumb that while I was playing that section, I'm with you guys where I was like, well, you know, when I replay this game, this is going to be the part that I kind of dread, at least so far. Uh, 
And then the, the fact that Adam just calls it out as a dungeon, I'm so stupid. But I'm like, oh yeah, you know what? That makes it feel better in my mind. Just like a classic Final Fantasy dungeon. If I look at it like that, which is obviously what it is. I don't know why it didn't connect like that in my mind. Uh, I, I just said the word dungeon for this and I saw your screen. You scoffed at me. Yeah, that's right. It's more of a scotch. Anyways, we'll get to him later. Travis Mannix says, hey, when you're powering down the sun lamps, they are enormous. When you return to the slums and look up at the plate again, take a look at how small the sun lamps look. Just another great tool to give this world a sense of scale. Uh, that's a great point, Travis. Although I do love the idea that like they're going on this raid to to bomb things and sneak around Midgar and as they're going through their secretive way of getting by is just to shut the sun off real quick. Like no one notices. Mm. Or at that point, I guess they're just so like F it that like, you know what? We've been seen at this point before. So let's shut the sun off. And Shinra, if they know where we are, they can come attack us. Or, or the way that I could interpret it w was that uh, this might be something that happens kind of commonly. So mm. like power, power shuts off. I mean, like, you, you know right away that there's not enough power for everything to work already. And so, you know, yeah, it, it's possible. Sure. Yeah, that, they also had that line that where they're like, yeah, people haven't been down years down here in years. No one checks here, you know, yeah. which right. enough of context for me to not really think about, you know, that element too much. It could but, be okay, one of the yeah, spiders. They would, they would not notice us turning these things off. Yeah. And it seems like that's the standard maintenance practice just to even get those conveyor belts to move. So... Right. Yeah, so, so you're wrong, Hanson. Okay. Yeah, uh, not, not enough Mako. <laughs> Zach Galo says, I have mixed feelings about Chapter 6. On the one hand, the lights at the top of the plate offer some interesting insight into life in the slums of Midgar. I hadn't considered what this part of Midgar uh, looks like, but I appreciate getting close up at the weird substitute for daylight for the slums. On the other hand, I found the level design to be confusing and rote in this section. I found myself getting turned around a lot and getting a hold of that extra materia ended up being a huge pain. Uh, Justin Swartz says, after completing chapter six, I couldn't help but feel like this chapter felt like filler material. I appreciated the view of the slums far below to give you a sense of scale and height, but otherwise this area came across as an uninteresting series of maze-like catwalks with few enemy encounters and little character development. This is the first piece of content that I found that could have been cut out of the game and it would not have suffered. Um, I, I kind of agree with that. I, I also, but also it, it kind of gives you like that, that first opportunity for, for um, Cloud, Tifa, and Barrett to have their own um, communication between each other and what like what that group dynamic is going to look like. Yeah, other than talking about Stamp and what Stamp's nose looks like and how well done the Stamp graffiti is and what your favorite thing about Stamp is. and Which is about 20% of the uh, uh, original game. So. <laughs> That's right. Barrett also up there, he says the line, the rot runs deep in this pizza. It's yes. really stuck in my brain for some reason. <laughs> it's like, is that like a really good line or just a really weird line? I'm not sure. It's a callback. He says it in the original game and also in the remake in the first section God. where he calls it a rotting pizza above him. And like, there's even a, I missed that. Okay. a song in the soundtrack is referencing the, the pizza. Um, but I like just the terminology, I think, for the world of Midgar. Like what they call them grounders. I think like a couple guards later on called like the, the people living in the slums, the grounders, but then just talking about like, oh, that effing pizza up there. Like that type of shorthand I'm really into in sci-fi. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, okay. I'm sorry? Uh, they also made reference to like people that live up on the plates too. And I can't remember what it was. Yeah. Uh, but Platers there was, there was or something. A reference as well. Yeah. Uh, Darkfish Days says, I enjoyed how the catwalk maze opened up a little and encouraged exploration. My favorite Secret in this area is next to a third next to the third sun lamp. If you move the bridge too far to the upper right, you can knock a ton of Shinra boxes off a storage shelf. It's a good amount of loot, including two Moogle medals and two Phoenix Downs. Did anybody else do this? Yeah. No, no cool. I didn't. It is the most satisfying moment of the game so far, I believe, in a gameplay context, because you knock over like 20 to 30 Shinra boxes and it's just like, oh my God, paid it. You go over there and it's just, it's a little preview of whack -a box baby. And I got like an elixir in there and some stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it was weird because I had run over to that area first and it's like, well, there's nothing over here. And they, yeah. they kind of teach you to screw around with like the positioning of those things. So it was like, all right, I got to I got to push it all the way up and I got to push it all the way over even though I did, I wasn't expecting anything to happen. But then when it knocked over all the boxes, I was like, yeah, this is fun. Um, so we had, we had a developer write in who preferred to stay anonymous, but let's just say their name rhymes with Bill Bite. Um, uh, so uh, anonymous developer writes in and says, I really like the level designs, level designers' subtle, subtle use of lighting to denote where a path might take you. 
soft white blue lights for the main progression path, red lights for you came this way, and a yellow occasionally used for optional stuff this way. This sort of thing is used throughout more of the game, but I always like this method of light touch guiding the player through a location. It allows the player to feel their way through things without really knowing why, ideally helping them feel good about their experience and figuring it out on their own. That, uh, that's awesome. Very smart. I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah, I, I would have never noticed that. No, Sam, it's peeling back the curtain a little bit. I, it's something I never noticed before. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's definitely noticeable with like Naughty Dog games. They're always big for like using the light to show you. Whenever you're confused about where am I supposed to go, look for the well-lit area in the room. It's like, okay, got it, you know? Sure. Um, yep. Sam Marsden says, hello, Chadley super fans. Hello. Uh, deactivating the three sun lamps wasn't the most fun I've had playing this game, but figuring out how to get the purple, blue, and red materia kept me motivated to figure this puzzle out. The blue... Elemental materia is a game changer. Adding an element to your basic attacks is a ton of fun. Once I found the red summoning materia, I realized the one-minute time battle was repeatable. Uh, and then Ricky Winterbottom says, I missed the elemental materia for weapons early on. Anyone know of a second chance to get it? Um, and it turns out that uh, there isn't a ch second chance to get that. You can replay oh, that's devastating. chapters later on. Did anybody get the elemental materia? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. God. And I use it all the time. Oh my yeah. God. I don't believe I got it. Unless I got it and just didn't notice it or was confused by the description, but that seems Yeah, it's one of the few blue ones and and it seriously comes in handy all the time when you're fighting boss battles and stuff because you can, you know, like if something's weak to lightning and you just slot that sucker into Cloud's sword, then like every hit that you're doing is doing it, you know, yeah. a little bit extra damage. Oh my yeah. god, I need that. Yeah. Yeah. In, in fact, it's it's honestly probably the most satisfying part of the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you didn't see those Shinra boxes. They fell off of the shelf, you see. Uh, uh, can, you, can you swap out Materia mid-fight? I so this, you couldn't. No. Uh, Kyle, okay. th this was something that I wanted to, like, this is something that I've been wanting to ask you guys for a long time because I'm just not looking up anything on the internet, which is like for for weapons. It seems like like the weapons are are all like at least for Cloud. You know, it, it seems like the Buster Sword is kind of like this nice balanced sword, and then the next one seems like it's a little bit more oriented towards like magic. Nail bat is like pure physical damage, and it seems like it's like a system that was meant to be able to switch out weapons on the fly based on the enemies that you're fighting. But it doesn't seem to be the case because, like, you know, there are times where you go in and you might you might be against an enemy that is uh, uh, weak against magic. But there's not really much you can do about that if you don't have that weapon already equipped. I guess you just have yeah. to retry from the start of the fight because they always give you that little moment before you're right in the middle of it again where you can change sure. the materia and your items. So maybe if you just pause it, you have that option ready to go in combat, right? And maybe maybe that is the the solution there. But yeah. Yeah, but that that it has been my biggest complaint of the combat so far. Is sometimes I just go I go into fights, especially boss fights, and it's like, well, its weakness is lightning, and I still have fire slotted in, and I mm -hmm. don't have anyone. I I didn't you know have ESP right. and know that I needed my lightning materia for this one. Yeah, and it's like hell house. Yes, and I don't have yeah. enough like material slots. Just like, well, I'll have all the different types in there. Yeah. It's like right. very yeah. specific. Yeah. Like, okay, cloud is lightning. The end. You know, I don't have yeah. flexibility here, uh, especially like yeah, when it's just you and Aerith too. It's like you don't got that much to work with here. But uh, so I'm not missing something where people are like, yeah, you can swap out weapons in this way. No, that or we're all missing it. But uh, it seems like it just goes to a pause menu instead of the, the typical. Yeah, I'm amazed that like you can't, as far as I can tell, you can't sell weapons. And just overall, the equipment in this game, it's so weird to come from like your deepest dive on Chrono Trigger where that game is pretty clear about like, this weapon that you picked up is better. Equip that one, sell the old one. This one's clearly better. This one's clearly better. And every time I get a new weapon in this game, I'm like, here we go, hot damn, new, better weapon. And then it's like, ah, kind of a mixed bag. I don't know if I should switch. I guess mm -hmm. I should for the ability and learn that. Yeah. Like, have you guys noticed yeah. that too? Yeah, and then you like yeah. level up the weapon. You're like, well, maybe once I level it up, it'll be stronger. And it's like, and yeah, it usually I, gets I, there, but there's no slam yeah. dunks in terms of equipment. I've noticed. I, I understand like some people really like that because they like being able to sort of change their equipment based on their play style. But yeah. I, I'm yeah, definitely the sure. kind of RPG guy that just wants like the better sword. Like that's more satisfying to me. So yeah. I, I don't, I don't love that. I don't really like having to like 
decide what I want to lose to gain and, and stuff like that. You know? but, I, I do appreciate, though, that you get to continue upgrading like the Buster Sword throughout the entire game. Yeah, right. And it yeah. doesn't it doesn't just become underpowered at any point. And I do think it is a, a really smart decision that you have those weapon specific moves but if you use it you use you don't even have to use it that much you use it enough and then you unlock that ability for the other ones so i do find myself switching to all the different weapons just to play with them a little bit in order to get that extra ability yeah i guess i thought that they're a little bit i might out myself as a as a colossal idiot here but i thought they're a little bit like materia where it would just like level up on its own and then it wasn't until like i don't know why Aerith isn't learning this ability okay i guess i have to actually use this ar yeah. arcane move just a couple mm -hmm. times to actually lock it in here but uh fred de novo says let's talk about the weapon upgrade menu i love upgrading weapons allows for continued use of the buster sword and the other less iconic swords but wow navigating that menu is a nightmare it looks great but with a resemblance to materia and all but i'd love if it could just be like a scroll up or scroll down list to get to new materia slots, attack power plus five, etc. Yeah, I could see that. It's it's a little funky, but it, it's it, they definitely leaned aesthetic over like you know making yeah. it a little clearer yeah. to read. But. I think my biggest complaint is that I can't just switch between characters and what weapons they have equipped easily. You have to back out several Watch layers to the menu. Again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely it's overproduced in a way, and in a you know. I remember seeing the screenshot for the first time and thinking it was the Materia screen and thinking, oh, are they trying to make it look like, you know, an observatory later in the game? Like, is that overthinking this? Because it is such a weird, funky layout. It's it's very odd. Um, That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, Andres Martin says, hey, for combat, I wasn't a huge fan of Cloud until I discovered that switching from Operator to Punisher in the middle of an attack instantly cancels the attack and gives you a second or two where you'll counter any attack. It's absolutely changed the way I play, and I'm and it made his combat much more enjoyable. Now that it's been uh, more than a couple hours, do you guys have any tips or tricks for cracking what feels like the deepest Final Fantasy combat system in a while? Uh, a quick one, actually, because I I streamed the game a little bit, which got me some nice little tips from people watching. Yeah, is like when you're what is it, Operator and Punisher yeah. mode? In Punisher mode, if you kind of like combo your way through an attack, but then you end the the combo by holding down the button. You do one final really big strong attack. Oh, okay. Which is nice. And then also another one that I know I this is outside of combat, but I, like when you use potions outside of combat, because you can't go into the main menu and just use potions. Yeah. If you when you select, you know, you go to the command list, you select the person, you select one what you want to give them. If you hold down L one, you can just keep giving them potions. You don't. Oh you don't my god. Them. Because yeah. I've been doing a lot Super of that. Super handy. I, that, I, someone told me that on the stream, and I was like, oh my god, that is amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> so just hold down L1, and I don't have to spend 25 minutes healing Tifa. That is, that's correct, yes. Oh. <laughs> Get oh, to. Uh, Grant, you're a, you're a smart, systems-focused person. How are you dealing with the combat? How has it evolved over time for you? Um, I guess I don't know if I'd say that it's evolved so much for me. Um making more use of uh, the parry system in Punisher mode, I think is probably the most beneficial thing. Um, I, I don't know. I've just, I found it to be very fun. Um, yeah. Once so f um, I assume he died. Wasn't, su once. wasn't super pleased about it. Uh, it was during the, re during the Reno fight. Uh, his unblockable attacks that interrupt your heals, uh, that's not satisfying to me. But other than that, it's been great. That is absolutely the thing that has made me want to scream. Like, okay, Ricky Winterbottom gets to it here. He says, does anyone else get really pissed off when a smell slash move gets canceled by an attack and it's just gone? Yes. I get that it's yes. a difficulty decision, but I feel like they should fall. Like they should fall, get back up, and still cast the move you chose. Uh, and then Andrew Valla says, think that's bad. Wait until you finally trigger a limit break only to have, one, a mid-fight cutscene prevents you from using it. Two, oh. the enemy moves out of the way and cloud whiffs. Or three, another character pushes the enemy out of the way. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. having That happened with Hell House for me. It's like, I was like, all right, limit break. Here we go. I hit him once and then it went to a cutscene for like the second phase of the battle. I was like, oh, yeah. come I, on. <laughs> I also had that same experience. Oh, and... oh shit. Yeah, I had that with um, Reno, I think, where I used my limit break. And then it's like, oh, there's that weird cross thing saying I, it's not doing any damage. Like, what's going on? Oh, I have to wait for him to give his little speech. Like, that is infuriating. And it seems like sometimes when you get hit, when you're about to cast a spell or use an ability, you'll still pull it off. 
And I'm trying to figure out what that distinction is. If it's just like you're knocked down, then it's nullified. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's yeah. so frustrating. I, though. I, kind of, that Dark Souls training has just like gotten me to a point where like I, I I make sure to get out of the way and try to get to safety and and try to build in time to cast uh, like those spells and something like that. But just which is something I had to like turn on. Like it, it took a while for me to be like, oh, I guess I need to approach this a little bit like that because I assumed I could just cast them whenever I wanted. You know. Right. Yeah. It it does either, feel. Okay. It's either when you get back up, let the spell go off, or give, at least give you back the ATB that you lost. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. The, the the worst part of that is losing that ATB, and I don't know. I don't know if you. I haven't paid enough attention to know if you also lose the MP. But oh. in, 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 in that is the case. Yeah. I mean, the ATB enough is is that sucks. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jonathan Quavedo says uh, he really wishes that you had the option for a hard mode at the start. He says the bosses, uh, their HP is too low, and I'm just staggering them immediately, and then it's time for a cutscene. And also he said Aerith is wildly overpowered and decimates everything in her path. Arcane Ward is something else. Uh, Adam, yes. Adam Moran says, what are your favorite character abilities? Aerith's Arcane Ward automatically doubles whatever offensive spell you use, but you have to remain in the circle while you cast it. It makes it really fun to play as her offensively and try to attack from the circle without getting walloped. Uh, favorite abilities, favorite spells? How are you guys doing? Um, Cloud's new... Oh, gosh. With the... Infinity's Hardage, End? I think it's called. Yes. Oh, yes. my God. Like, that's just like... I, I don't know how much damage... But it was like one-shotting... Uh, so many, like, e- even, like, in the arena, it was, like, one-shotting characters that were, I think, supposed to have a little bit more um, HP. So that, that's a lot of fun. Yes. Which ability? Uh, it it's is called, like, inf- Infinity's so, Edge. So, yeah, Yara wrote oh, in oh, saying man. it's the Hard Edge ability. He says it's absolutely incredible. Uh, it destroys enemies in one combo. Uh, and so, yes, thank you, Yara, for writing in about that. Um, Ricky Winterborn says, who's your favorite character to control at this point? Tifa is the most satisfying, whereas Aerith has me strategizing the most for Ricky. Tifa. I think I like really... Cloud, man. I like hitting stuff with a big yeah. sword. I I'm a cloud man. I think I'm yeah. still cloud number one, but I like Aerith more than I expected. Like, just like getting her out of the gate and having her do more, more kind of be like the AOE person, both with healing and attacks, I think yeah. is really fun and different. Um, I renamed her AOE with in the game, actually. <laughs> I think I'm going to start with it. I find myself using her her AOE ability quite a bit. Um, yeah. The thing's a juggernaut. It just wipes people pretty fast. And I can't wait for Prey to level up because it's one of the things that like, it takes two bars to use, which seems expensive for like, you know, maybe 600 healing for both people at this point. It's like, well, kind of jump change oh, I here. I use that all the time. I, I use it a lot too, but it's expensive for what it does. And I, I look forward to it evolving a little bit here. Um, Thwip says, as of right now, I think Aerith is my favorite character to play as. I do a fair amount of character hopping, but I find her play style is the most enjoyable. I was surprised at how fun it is to play as her because making combat fun for magic characters seems really tricky in more action-focused games, but I think they really nailed it. And uh, Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I love that. I mean, like, the fact that they just, they make her um, her staff, like, just do magic with its square move is great. That she's not just, like, trying to bash things for... 12 damage yes. like she did in you know, the, the original. She's fun to play as, and she's strong. She's powerful. And yeah, with, with the ward, um, she might just be the most effective character so yeah. far. Uh, tell me if I'm uh, losing my mind here, but I was thinking about what makes this game unique, and it's like, it's rare to have such well-produced, like characters at this level of production value where you can control multiple characters. Can anybody think of another example of a game that's this well produced where you can jump between characters? I know it's just in combat more or less here, but like GTA Dynasty 5 but Warriors. Dynasty yeah. great point. But it's pretty rare, right, to have them all yeah, animate yeah. so well and they all play so differently and look so unbelievably good. It's wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, real yeah, time I think, switching like that's is rare for sure. Yeah, I I think that thing is probably something that we don't don't even give enough attention to of just like how difficult that must be. But how great it is that all of them feel so good. Maybe yeah. Dragon Age, uh, the original one. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. One I yeah. can think of. But... Uh, Fred DeNovo says, "I would love, love, love a way to default as a non-cloud character as fights begin. Outside of boss fights, these skirmishes are so quick; it's almost not worth switching. But I'd like to play more as Tifa." And then Alan Leibold is a hero, and he jumped in there and said, "Hey, Fred, just so you know, under battle settings in the menu." 
Select a character and press triangle to set them as the leader, and you'll start battles automatically controlling them. Oh, well, that's cool. very nice. I had no idea. I saw there was like that party leader thing in the menu. I'm like, wait, can I run around as another character? But good to know that's what it's all for, apparently. Uh, EJ Crow says, hello. I am a Final Fantasy 15 apologist. I really dug the game after playing it on PC. Anywho, there are some aspects of 15's combat I really wish were a part of 7's, most specifically the link attacks. Does anyone else feel the same? Well, I'm really enjoying the 7 remake. There are definitely aspects of the combat that I feel it could be improved. Do you think we'll see, if it, see an evolution of the gameplay in Final Fantasy Remake Part 2? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It'll expand. Yeah, I do, I, and, and that's a good point. Um, I, I do know, I think that there's a material that you pick up that actually like links attacks together that if you do one thing, then another character does a follow-up move that you sort of prescribe. I haven't used that yet, but it's, you know. Yeah, I haven't either yet. Is that a Chadley thing? Because I don't know if I have it. It might be. It um, might be, yeah. We're spending a lot be. of time at Chadley just begging him for scraps. So I, I have that I one mean, too. In, yeah. in I spend a lot of time actively avoiding Chadley. <laughs> so it might be in there. You'll rue the day, Grant! <laughs> in 15, those link attacks almost are, are kind of like limit breaks that are almost the equivalent uh, here in 7 Remake. Sure, right, and yeah. And they happen more often in 15. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm with them. I, I, it's it's funny. I think I said it last time, but I'm surprised how much I'm thinking of 15 as I play this game. It, there's a lot. There's a lot of lines to draw there for sure. Yeah. Uh, Sam Marsden says, "Hello, Chadley wannabes. I think this is the chapter where you get uh, the poisoning materia. I never really go for status ailment strategies in games myself, but have any of you, have any of you been using one? No. It's like I said. Uh, like, I, <laughs> I don't have enough slots for all these things. Yeah, you really have to make some some." big decisions with with the slots that you have so has anybody got a funky thing in their slot uh deadly dodge dude still got that deadly, deadly dodge. dodge yeah i do i deadly dodge i'm using more and more i really like it a lot uh yeah uh, like cloud does a nice like spin attack when you come out of the roll now yeah, which does yeah. like which was awesome for that box breaking mini game too yeah it's very nice i guess the funkiest thing might be uh, i still have assess equipped for chadley even though i'm yes. trying to avoid him <laughs> Yeah, I will have it in there Chubby's for a while. Chubby's not a bad guy, dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's us. I, I, I love it's us, actually. Yeah, yeah I've, been, I've been swapping it out. But it does help a lot, especially for bosses. For like, okay, what is the puzzle here? And it's like, oh, just do right. this. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, I, I tried using the um, like the ATB filler for a while. Um, yeah, where you, like, you pop it, then it's like, that's not worth it for an entire slot. And I think you can use it. There's a cooldown to it. It's like, it's not that effective. But the one that's really cool is there's one that is a limit break that you can put for any character that segments your ATB into three bars. Refocus. Yeah, that seems unbelievably yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, it's it's wonderful. I actually use that on the on the Hell House. Hell House. Uh, so what about um? I was surprised by Auto Cure because I had that I think for Tifa, but didn't have uh, Cure equipped for her, and I was amazed that she was still using it. I just thought that it would activate Cure if you also had it, but I was amazed that like you don't even need Cure as a materia on that character they'll just use it automatically i haven't cool. used it oh really yeah. likewise yeah. It, it's handy uh, it's because then other people heal you so it is a good point uh adam Morant says the way party member barks continue uninterrupted when you engage come command mode is awesome like the slowdown mode a little yeah. reverb is sprinkled on their voices and it makes the combat feel really cinematic highlighting the moment-to-moment -moment action yeah, I love that. It's always fun hearing things and seeing things in slow motion. Like, I was slayed, slayed comedically during the rude boss fight when he's spinning Cloud around. I just happened to go <laughs> into the command menu and then, like, seeing Cloud, like, Wah! like getting spun around by rude is just, Mwah. it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the party member barks, though, like, it's definitely, you know, they got their magic jokes about, like, chill out and all that stuff, but there's a couple of those that make me laugh. Like, there's one time where Aerith was curing me and said, I'll take care of you. And then attacked an enemy a second later and goes, I'll take care of you. <laughs> like, <laughs> what a weird thing. And there, was, there was one time uh, uh, for me where uh, Cloud says like something like, like, stay close to me. And she says, I can take care of myself, you know. And then one of those... Um, alien looking things just jumped on her face <laughs> and just she started screaming just, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and me Claude and me <laughs> <laughs> oh Aerith oh yeah uh, so that was she also a little side note here yeah um, 
I saw a uh, short clip of the voice actress for Aerith. Uh, she was playing a Twitch stream and reacting to her seeing herself or hearing herself as Aerith for the first time in the game. Uh, it was a really, um, it kind of yeah. looked like she was a big fan of the game. And I'm sure it must be super satisfying as a voice actor to get to play a part in a game that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think that was Kyle's get a load of this on the Minmax show. Was it last week or something? But oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, very cool. I don't, I I don't buy it because she's an actor. But um, yeah, it is very sweet. I have no I, faith in anyone who has ever acted at anything. It's a they sinful can't be occupation. With human emotion? Absolutely not. Uh, but at the same time, I was amazed that uh, somebody tweeted at me and said, because we're asking if Patrick Warburton, at least maybe I was, if he's in the game, just a voice that sounds so much like him. He apparently tweeted, he goes, No, that's not me, but it's actually my son. Patrick Warburton's son what? is the guy who sounds exactly like Patrick Warburton. So I don't know if it's just like deep default Warburton voice or if his son is doing an impersonation of his dad in chapter three or what the hell is going on there. So uh, is Sam Elliott's son also? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I guess we got to rip off the Sam Elliott band-aid here. Okay. Charles Bean says Chocobo Sam Sam Elliott impression is spot on, and I was surprised. Wait, I got it, I got it, I got it. Should, should we wait until we get to chapter nine? I'm I mean, that's we, just... We're not doing it chronologically. I mean, look, it's deepest dive, baby. It's all over the place. Whatever people write in about. <laughs> okay. all right. uh, but yes, uh, he was surprised when they found out that it was not actually Sam Elliott. And that's that weird thing, too, of like... What? <laughs> <laughs> how do they do is it just sam coincidentally and then in the casting they're like wait a minute a cowboy named sam well we have to get somebody to do a spot on sam elliott impersonation i mean there's there was no i was like this sounds like sam elliott there's no way this is actually sam elliott no but I was way like, it's like well but i'll i'll check imdb just just to be sure just to be sure <laughs> okay i didn't even look because i said this is definitely sam elliott <laughs> i mean his name is sam i don't know where the confusion is <laughs> Call me Mr. <laughs> Elliot, please. Uh, Fred DeNovo says, also, uh, that coin only looks like a head. Where does he get off yes, saying yes. that they're both tails? I feel <laughs> yes, like I'm taking yes. crazy pills. <laughs> I know. I, I selected heads and it was like, and it, it landed on, I thought I was like, oh, great, landed on heads. I guess I guessed correctly. <laughs> and then Sam oh, Elliot I, was like, oh, no, this is tails. Oh, I said, okay, that's Watch amazing. Me on Netflix, I said tails. I said tails. And he goes, it's heads. It's a two headed coin. <laughs> Well, they originally so no matter what. I think they <laughs> reveal that it's a two-headed coin. Wait, so you won that, Ronnie? No, he said it was no. heads. Okay, gotcha. That's... No matter what you choose. Yeah, but it's just confusing because you look at it and it's like, it doesn't look like a tail in any stretch, but he said that it was a tail for me, so I had that same impact. Uh, I, I love, too, that Chocobo Sam's just got a big whip. Imagine that guy just whipping the <laughs> hell out of a chocobo. Like, Ever seen it? an angry chocobo? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good point. I get it. I've seen a fat one, not an angry one. <laughs> That's right. Uh, ooh, speaking of chocobo and getting back on chronological order, um, Nasir uh, Siddiqui says, I love that the wind elemental chocobo and Moogle summon materia is behind a huge industrial fan that's almost blowing the party over. What a great spot for it. And oh. Hyperlight Blossom says, when you pick up the Chocobo and Moogle summon, summoning Materia, Barrett goes, man, I wonder what kind of badass is going to pop out of this one. Mm. <laughs> How did you get that? Because <laughs> I, I think I saw it, but I didn't see a way to get it. I didn't get my... it. I didn't even see it. Like, throughout the entire chapter, I saw what? there was I one purple yeah. there, and, like, I went out it's of my way. It's impossible to not see that. Yeah. I didn't see it. They like The they... game stops and shows Point it. <laughs> yeah, but it. how do you get it, though? Uh, there's you a ladder there's a ladder you go up and you fight uh, a time sequence. It's like a uh, countdown you have to finish this fight and you can shut off the fan. Oh, oh yeah, weird. I didn't. I saw it, but I didn't get it. That's a bummer. It's another detour down there that you have to take. Mm. Yeah, okay. Mm. But like during that section, I saw there was purple materia. And so I went out of my way to get that one. And it ended up being like MP up. And I was like, cool, thanks. And so right. I, just, I, I probably would have gone our way to get this if I would have seen it. But I don't know how I missed yeah. it. It's right after... Uh, Barrett says, oh, I wasn't worried about me. I was worried about your bony ass blowing off this thing. Yeah. Uh, there's the red material sitting right there. I, Which the camera yeah. pans to and says, hey, there's red material right here. <laughs> I, thought I, that was, I thought that was part of Barrett's body. <laughs> well, it is. Oh, I see. Uh, chapter 7 says, killing rat. Well, <laughs> chapter 7. Chapter 7 <laughs> came alive and sent me a message. It said, help me. I'm a construct. Uh, Joshua Wilgenen says, killing rats in the Sector 7 slums was bad enough, but I was bored as hell turning off those damn lights in the Sector 5 reactor, and I almost quit altogether while gathering key cards. 
Is this the expanded story Square promised us? Do these game lengtheners add anything to the game? Regardless, Cloud got an HJ, so 10 out of 10. <laughs> 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 and, but the I thought I thought the key card part was an interesting was an interesting thing where you're you're building up to this big boss fight. They they made such a big deal about it. But I like the idea that you can you can look at what its abilities are going to be, and then you kind of decide which parts you want to dismantle. I I didn't mind that. You know I, that, that I didn't like that, that didn't feel like just random filler to me. No, oh, yeah. anytime you're collecting a key card in a game, maybe it's just because we just uh, survived the dirge, and maybe some people listening or watching this also survived the dirge with us. Dirge of Cerberus on PS2 with a full playthrough, um, and that yeah, entire game is inching along and finding key cards. So I saw this section of collect multiple of the key cards. I actually reached for a pistol. Um, I had to <laughs> I had to be talked out of it because it was brutal. Um, but I felt like I was at home. <laughs> uh, Nicholas Freitas says I love when the remake takes memorable things from the original and cranks it up to 11 the fact that Airbuster gets an entire dungeon and multi-phase boss fight and even the dumb lever minigame gets expanded into a side uh, activity uh, Zach Galou says allowing the player to choose how they handicap the Airbuster really blew my mind I've never seen a game build up a boss fight so much while also allowing you to choose which ways you can weaken it before the actual, the actual fight starts genius game design Justin Mack would get along with Zach Galoo very well because Justin Mack wrote in and says, being able to choose how to impair parts of the Airbuster? Genius! I thought it was <laughs> such a unique way to give the player some agency over a player, over a battle that we all know is coming. Uh, yeah, the fact that, you know, before the game came out, I think I was joking around even about how much they're building up the Guard Scorpion. Like, yeah, we get it, Guard Scorpion, we got it. And now it's just like, you remember the Airbuster? Oh boy, you're going to. because this... Wait, you don't remember the Airbuster? <laughs> I mean... Decent bot, like the first time you get to hear like that version of the battle theme in the original seven, I do believe. So like he's notable for that for me, but then it is just like, oh yeah, it's a boss in the original game. He's he's fine. And then in this game, they make it seem like it's the second coming of Christ, like the Airbuster. Have you heard about the Airbuster? He's coming. It's just incredible. Most advanced technology. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a crappier version of everything else you fought in this game. And then they all stop when they see it. They're like, May God have mercy on our souls if that thing comes to life. It's got arms. <laughs> Big one, Steve. It's got a fan boat for a butt. <laughs> <laughs> there is this weird disconnect in this game. And I know, Ronnie, you mentioned it on last week's episode when you said that certain characters look like they're different species. But, <laughs> but there's a disconnect with, like, the styles. And I love the their attempt to modernize these old freaky styles that is all throughout this chapter. It's like, oh my God, it's so weird. But I think the Air Buster is a good example of that, where it's not looking that much more intimidating than anything else you fought. But it's like, well, we got to stick with the original design, so we're kind of locked in this Air Buster-shaped box. Um, Wes Bates right. says that Air Buster fight was tough. It definitely felt like they upped the ante with that fight. I never wiped, but I definitely went through a few Phoenix Downs in that fight and burned quite a few other consumables to make it through. What did you think about the Airbuster fight overall? I loved it. Yeah, I liked how it kind of separated you from your other party members for a little bit, like which is almost an interesting tutorial on the advantage of like switching between people. Yeah, I I, yeah. I had a good time with that fight for sure. That to me that was the most notable thing about Airbuster in the original was that it was the first time your party was split like um one person was cut off. I think right. I think Cloud maybe was the one who was cut off. I don't I don't remember for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that could yeah, be. It yeah, was. And, and I like that moment in this fight too where they're like, I think they say something like, all right, Barrett, it's up to you. It's like, all right, everybody else can use magic. But when you're just on that plank, it's up to just switching to Barrett mm -hmm. and just unloading. But I mean, ugh, so many things about this section blew my mind. But going into Mako Reactor 5 and hearing the music and saying, hang on, did they make another version of the Mako reactor theme that we already heard in this game for this. That's mind boggling, but that's cool when they could have just reused it. And they also, you know, changed the color and changed a lot of the layout for the Mako reactor unlike the original, which kind of reuses it, reuses it one for one. But then the Airbuster fight, it's like, okay, we get the badass guitar, heavy metal uh, boss theme here. I was like, wait a minute. This is a new version of that boss theme that they now added an amazing choir to. It's just like the the soundtrack team for this game know how to tickle you on the right spots, ladies and gentlemen. It was, I, I, I would have done better on the fight had I, I, I couldn't stop just headbanging <laughs> the whole time. It was such a good song. My God, was that a great song. 
Do you think it is the musical highlight of the section? Yes. Bar- yeah, by a long shot. I think the Hell House uh, music also, is incredible. Yeah, well, the, the whole arena, I feel like, is, is just a treat. But no, I, I, I would say, like, for me, the Airbuster um, song was the best. Yeah, it is. Uh, to, like, have a badass choir, which in the original game they reserved oh. for the final fight, but to have that in the second most badass song in Final Fantasy VII is just mind-boggling. But uh, you guys want to talk about music for a little bit? A little detour? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So music, obviously still the star of the show. Hey, just in general, I was thinking about while playing this section and the music continued to rock my world, rocked me, Amadeus, um, was I've always considered, I think, Final Fantasy VIII to have the best Final Fantasy soundtrack. But at this point, can anything top Final Fantasy Remake Part 1 for the best Final Fantasy soundtrack of all time? I think it's taken the crown. Theater rhythm. (laughs) Theater rhythm is true. That's a good point. No, I, I'm I'm really loving. I, I love the music, and I also feel like there's been a shift as we get uh, into Wall Market, where it's almost getting more digital and sort of uh, techno-y at certain points, which is kind of interesting. Interesting, like maybe to its shift, detriment you know? for a couple uh, spots. But yeah, uh, Ronnie, you looked at me like I was nuts. No, I, I just think that like the I, I think the one thing about like Final Fantasy games that are that is most closely tied to nostalgia is music. Yeah, and 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 so I I think it's really tough to say like yeah this is the best because it's just so this feels like an argument that somebody could pick apart pretty pretty easily but um, I would say like objectively you're right okay wow um, <laughs> I've never been so satiated um and Ronnie you switched your mic but you want to get a little bit closer to the mic overall uh so Nick L from Atlanta he says there hasn't been nearly enough discussion about the music so far. I was really struck first in Chapter 2, but again during this section, as you fight towards the Sector 6 slums with Aerith, the soundtrack uses a remix of the original battle theme, which takes a page out of the same book as Monster Hunter World did. A more minimalistic version of the theme plays as you move across outside of combat, then once you get back into combat, it adds the musical layers to bring it to the full theme. Different tracks also feature musical motifs from Final Fantasy songs. This is the part that I'm fascinated by. Nick says, not just from 7, but also there's homages to music tracks from 8 and 13. Which hmm. I didn't hear, but if Nick provide examples, please. Did you guys hear anything like that? No, I wouldn't. Have I, I didn't notice if I if I'd heard it. Okay. I played a lot of thirteen, but I, like even that one, its music doesn't stand out as being particularly unique to me. Yeah, but that's I'm, that's actually yeah, the first that's... time that anybody said I played a lot of thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> I the only reference that I caught, and this is maybe a leap even, but when the Hell House is flying around, I think the move is called Heaven Sword. I'm like, oh, that's that fourteen I, yeah, expansion. I that, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Jonathan Fenn says the transition to the under the rotting pizza music when you get down from the rooftops is impeccable and two new pieces of music the sector five slums which is the instrumental version of the game's title track hollow do you know do you know this piece it is sing it for us (laughs) it's like smile more or something like that um is in like the theme song trailer and i guess it's the credits theme but i think i played it around you at some point ronnie like i genuinely think that song rules so when the sector five slums is just like this powerful acoustic version of that song i thought it was incredible it's really um, satisfying it is very good uh because it's just like there's that build up and even an acoustic it just kicks in so hard it's just like a bow wow wow um so uh he says and there's indian inspired music when you first enter the collapsed expressway both somehow fit alongside the classic score perfectly thank you jonathan Dr. Big says, I'm loving the heavy metal renditions of classic themes and boss fights. The two that stand out the most to me is the Airbuster battle theme and the fight with Reno in the church. Having yeah. like the energetic Turk boss theme is amazing. Uh, Ricky Winterbottom says, is anyone afraid that this game is doing too much too quickly? I've gotten so many music tracks already uh, that I can buy. How are they going to have enough for three or four games with this collection mechanic? Maybe they're planning on mixing in more original stuff later? I was amazed that with the collecting music thing, it's just like, hey, here's the Cosmo Canyon theme. Here's Costa del Sol. Here's a bunch of gold saucer. They're just throwing so much stuff at you, but it is an amazing right. way to like satisfy that nostalgia from the original game in part one. Yeah, and I, I, I wouldn't... You know, those, those sort of like lo-fi um, tracks of uh, music that we're going to hear later on, like obviously they've shown us that they can do so much with one track 
uh, that I'm not I'm not really worried about it. In fact, I I, I feel like with the the way that they're going is that they they're going to put like different emotional spins on tracks that we've heard so many times before, and I I have full confidence that it's going to work. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, when I'm sorting through all these comments, I'm listening to the original game soundtrack, and you forget how much of that soundtrack we haven't even touched yet. I mean, there's yeah. so many new songs in disc two, but even back half of disc one, you know, so I don't don't think that they're using everything at this point. But having like that jazzy version of the Cosmo Canyon theme is just amazing. Yeah. Um, and Time Bomb. I didn't like that one. Really? I, I don't know. No, there, there was one uh, like breakdown part that I thought just didn't didn't tickle my ears very well. <laughs> didn't tickle your ears. Didn't very well. Those small bones in your ears. Uh, Time Bomb Tom is a, a great new member of the Minmax community, and he has the killer comment here. How about that stamp theme song? <laughs> That's How about a weird what? one, yeah. The stamp theme song. Did you get that, Ronnie? The stamp theme song. Yeah, it's oh, like, it's like in a vending machine or something, right? Like it's not. It's it is, the side and it might be like a hidden here. vending machine too. But it is like this early '70s sounding theme song to what sounds like a stamp TV show, but it is, you know, it's a good soundtrack with even like their jokey song kicks ass. Like I listened to that song genuinely several times today. And I'm like, this song genuinely rules. <laughs> you got to find it, Ronnie, if you haven't found it yeah, yet. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, um, I feel like I would remember that. I don't know if I have that one. Ooh, oh, you're missing out. Uh, Henrik Mortensen says, I'm not a big fan of the fact that the fanfare is not used properly, but only like a joke with Barrett humming and things like that. It shows up a couple times, like in the arena stuff. I think, right? But when it's you go still, back. it's still always kind of like a jokey punchline. I think it's amazing yes. in that arena, but Henrik just wants it classic. But even beyond that, I was thinking about how bizarre this game is with the soundtrack, and how weird it is to have a Final Fantasy game where it's like there's no real main battle theme in this game. It is changing no. so much and just providing more intense versions of whatever music you're in. But unlike so many other Final Fantasies, it's not like ah the seven remake battle theme. Well, yeah. So his point is that he feels like those sort of nods to the old fan base are always uh, like a cheeky way. Or... He just thinks that it should be sincerely in the game instead of just like, hey, Barrett going, hey, da, 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 da. there you go, kids, moving on. I think it's kind of right, where Henry's coming from. But but like, I mean, like, they're uh, at the same time, like, they're honoring, like, you know, Aerith and Cloud um, on top of the, like, at the playground. And, like, I mean, there's so many moments that oh. are, like, I mean, of course, yeah, they're going back to the original musical well. He's just saying for the fanfare itself. And if you have a problem with Henrik Jacobson, you can write him yourself, Ronnie. Yeah, he can just unsubscribe. That's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Wow, that, that singing the fanfare thing, I mean, that's a trick they pulled in 15 as well. Like, yeah. That would, that would happen a lot in 15 also. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Andrew Burns says, Seven was already one of my favorite games of all time, and this remake is well on its way to supplanting it. Even though it's only taking a chunk of the original story, the degree to which it expands of all the things I love about the original is nothing short of breathtaking. I also absolutely love the reworked score and many of the new pieces as well. But with that being said... Holy Lord, that never-ending techno remix of the wall market theme that plays during the crane sequence with Aerith is one of the most horrific pieces of audio I've ever heard. And right. Henrik Mortensen also wrote it again, saying, love the music, but not the music in this Slum 6 uh, section in the tunnels with the crane game. It is... Yeah, let's move on. It's a bit much. <laughs> and then, like, yeah, and then I think there's a saxophone in there, or it's like kind of like a reggae sound uh, in the back half. Definitely the weakest yeah. song uh in the game so far i mean that whole section that's just like that's some game ass game stuff right there too controlling a little a little crane hand you know like i don't know i do i like how the hand like reverses like it almost like pushes its fingers the opposite way to like change hands like i feel like i've never seen that but like it's very smart and and weird looking yeah i liked it it's surprisingly well animated yeah i'm totally with you and like the fact that it's such a weird thing in the original game there's all these hands everywhere and that they pay it off in this one uh, by letting you control them. And then, like, Gareth even comments on the fact that there's hands everywhere. It's, it's very fun. Right. And there's the People also dog. actually have hands, too. And... <laughs> Instead well, of just big blocks. You know, you make that good nod to the that's history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no more uh, flesh-colored globes at the end of sticks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're in it now. Airbuster defeated. Uh, cloud falling a very long way 
Uh, it's okay though. He lands in flowers. Well, Justin so. Swart says, I'm a first time Final Fantasy VII player, so I want to make sure I'm tracking this correctly. After defeating the Airbuster, Cloud fell all the way from the reactor location down to the Sector 5 slums below, crashed through a church ceiling, landed in a flower bed, and he's fine after a little nap. Aerith calls him lucky and says the flowers are, quote, tougher than they look. He's, and then uh, Justin says, talk about a super soldier. You're forgetting, Justin. Right. As he was falling, he did use the grappling hook for like a little bit to slow him down in those first 40 feet. You will note, Justin. Yeah, it makes but perfect sense. But then also sense. in the original, they, they make a, a point about the, the, the church uh, roof uh, breaks his fall. <laughs> also, yeah, he... Justin, uh, we should point out um, Hell House is a thing in this universe. So <laughs> <laughs> you gotta shut up. He barely sped up over those last 800 feet. It was nothing. Yeah, no that's big true. Deal. That's true. You know what? The thing that struck me, like, uh, kind of sprinting into this whole section, like, Aerith was, like, surprisingly mean. Like, w was she always been that mean? Like, I, I played enough of the original to meet her and spend a lot of time with her, but I don't remember her being so mean and sarcastic with Cloud. Wes Bates writes in, Kyle, and says, I can't decide if I actually like this version of Aerith or not. In the original, I found her personality to be sweet and charming. In the remake, I feel like she comes off a bit overly assertive and unnecessarily sassy, and I honestly found it kind of off-putting. She doesn't even know Cloud, yet she treats them like they've been lifelong friends with her constant teasing. Even Cloud comments about it at her house when he says, quit acting like you know me. I think I like it. Oh, you yeah. like her being but mean. Maybe that's just what I'm into. I don't know. <laughs> like this. Well, I just like mean I, 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 women. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I found it more to be like um, playful, I guess. And, and that's something that Cloud, he doesn't have a language to interpret that. So he's just like looking, looking at this is probably a little bit just like off putting and, and maybe even hostile. But for her, I think that she's just being playful. But then also she just like comes across to me as, as pretty lonely. Um, and, and so I don't, I, I don't know if, if, if she's completely aware of, of how kind of like sheltered she's coming across. Yeah. And that is that weird dynamic too, that I kept thinking about is cloud is so pissy and he's such a broken person. And the fact that everybody's just calling about it, like Aerith at some points, like, yeah, you got a little skills cloud, but talking ain't one of them, you know, like right, everybody's yeah, calling him it. out. Um, but it's that weird thing where he's so pissy during these sections of like warming up to Aerith, but at the same time. Like, he wants to be with her. Like, he's craving this concept of a date. He's just terrible at expressing it, you know? That being said, like, th there is still that moment. I really like this when he was talking to Elmira about uh, where, where she says, like, hey, when you ch when you were recruited to be a soldier, like, you you gave away the, the opportunity for a normal life, and you gave that away for power. And Cloud's response to that was was essentially, like, you're right. And for that, I, I, I won't, I'll agree, I won't talk to her. Yes, she says, you guys made a trade, a normal life for power, you can't have them both, which is yeah. this amazing moment. And this is why I love uh, The Deepest Dive, is smart people write in like James Knight, who just like locks it into place, like, oh, that's what's going on here. James Knight says, I found it interesting that the mother figures for both Tifa and Aerith have been distrustful and suspicious of Cloud. I think it helps demonstrate the danger Cloud exudes with only the more experienced adults recognizing how bad Cloud can be for Tifa and Aerith. It's like going back to Marl and then with Elmira, they're both like, this guy's no good, dude. <laughs> I love that. Well, yeah, that, well, just that, yeah, he's, he's unknown. I mean, like, there's just nothing. He has no idea who he is in the first place. And, and it, it, you kind of feel like Tifa and Aerith both sort of see something in Cloud that that is different from what he exudes that the mother figures are not seeing. And, and what they are seeing is, are, are, is this kind of, you know, person that a, like doesn't know who he is, probably a little bit dangerous, like untrustworthy, you know? And, and so like from their perspective, they're just like, get him out of here. Cut it out. But also like Elmira just came across as so sad to me because like, you know, she has lived with Aerith. She knows Aerith's story. If you know the original game, you know Aerith's story a little bit better. And just the idea of Elmira is just like, worn out like get out of here dude like the soldier stuff f yeah, off I mean, dude she spends every night piling up her chairs in her stairwell and it's <laughs> Come on. um uh hamad pars well there's so much to, to get through here uh hamad parza says when Aerith's mom told cloud to stay away from her without missing a beat uh he goes you got it and then leaves um yeah, I thought that was really interesting because I had to go back and check the footage that I captured to see how he reacted. But she says, promise me you'll never talk to Aerith again. 
And Cloud yeah. is just like, yeah, you got it. Like, deal. He obviously... Which, which I, I think made sense. Because I think he... I feel like he... Like, the story inside of himself is that, yeah, like, I'm not normal. Um, I'm not... And, and you're seeing... Elmira's seeing that right now. And he'll, he'll immediately cave when he says, like, I see you. You're not like her. Go away. And it, immediately he'll go, yep, absolutely. <laughs> Called me out. That Done. makes... That makes sense to me, honestly. Yeah. Uh, Evan Plumley says, a moment that made me cringe uh, was when Cloud first met Aerith's mom, Elmira, and seconds after being introduced, Cloud snaps at Aerith and says, stop acting like you know me. It was uncomfortable meeting a girl's mother for the first time, then yelling at her daughter right in front of her. <laughs> like, that, that did stand out with me, too. It's like, come on, Cloud. Like, you literally just walked in this house and you're immediately screaming at this lady's daughter. It's like, he's not a well-balanced individual, I'd argue. No, and I think that's like, that lends itself to like, it's not really an act for him. Like this is something like the past, you know, five or so years have been so like during the, the developmental times of, of just like self identity, like Claude was in a completely different place where he was not able to figure out who he is in this sort of social perspective. And so it, it like makes sense to me that he does have these moments of just like that other people are like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, Rory Sublet says, I really like Cloud response. Cloud response to one of the kids asking if he fought in the war. Cloud just says, I might have. And lastly, uh, maybe I've just never noticed, but has Cloud's mom always been named Claudia? <laughs> that made no. me laugh. Out <laughs> That's new as far as I know. I'm trying to think in Crisis Core or anything if you see that. Oh, maybe. But I, I like that. I like that. I'm because they don't explicitly say it's her, his mother, but it was like pretty safe to assume that unless I miss something. And she says something like, uh, you need to you need to find a nice woman to stop you from becoming a silly goose. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, that's his main problem is becoming a silly goose. He's really. Well, I, I do love it. the idea uh, of know, just like, hey, thing... you need an older woman to like call you on your sh, dude. Right. The one thing that I, I I thought is like, God, one of them, it's either gonna be Tifa or Earth is gonna call him a silly goose at some point. Oh, of course. And he's gonna flip out. He's gonna be. <laughs> he's gonna be so pissed. <laughs> Yeah, could be just could be <laughs> start flapping his arm. <laughs> oh yeah, that seems like Jesse ter Jesse territory. Um, and then uh, somebody also wait, Claudia. Yeah, Claudia, silly name. Uh, but sure, we'll go along with it. I loved seeing just it was a thrill in the original game to see like quick scenes with Cloud's mom and the idea that in this game you get like I was gonna say full frontal of Cloud's mom, but you know what I mean. Just like her <laughs> face, like up close and personal, was just super fun to see. And during that, okay. Wasn't that a scene you were directly asking for that you wanted Cloud's mom fully uh, fully realized? Yeah, and it was there. It's amazing. Uh, turns out this remake don't disappoint so far. Uh, Darkfish Days says in the flashback with Claudia, Claudia Strife, uh, we see a young Cloud wearing brand new soldier gear paired with an armor paired with armor on each soldier. Before I saw this flashback, I assumed that the current shoulder armor with bolts was just a badass look. But then I noticed that it's made up of two layers. Could it be that Cloud bolted a new shoulder piece on top of his previous armor? It does seem in character for Cloud to hold on to his past, but also have a need to cover it up. Darkfish Days. Specific yeah, very comment. Very good. Um, I went back yeah. and checked it. Yeah, it's like just this one quick layer. So he does slap on another layer that has like the bolts on it for his weird shoulder thing. Um... On the topic of Cloud, Brian Regal writes in, he says, Cloud's a dick to some of the people in Sector 6. I mean, the side quest with the graveyard and the elderly person? Man, Cloud can be cold sometimes. Almost too cold. And Sean Mills says, after paying the respects, after paying respects side quest, the poor old man who gave you the quest asks you to return the cemetery key, and Cloud tells him it'll cost him 5,000 gil. Why is Cloud such a jerk to anyone not flirting with him? Uh, <laughs> I think my favorite part of that, too, is that Right after he's so cold to that guy, uh, Aerith chimes in like, doesn't it feel good to help people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he goes, ah. Like he makes the sound <laughs> yeah. that's exactly like the peanut butter baby. And actually I tweeted it out from the MinMax account, <laughs> uh, mashing those two up because it has to be a peanut butter baby reference, right? And if you're not familiar with peanut butter baby, you need to <laughs> improve your you day. Developed Final Fantasy VII Remake because that is just a coincidence. <laughs> yes, I guess you're right. Uh, <laughs> but Alan comments on that paying respects thing where he says, it's really strange compared to when the kids very recently ask him for his help and he starts out with the usual for the right price attitude, only turn right around and say, I'll do it for three gil. It's like he still doesn't want to drop the cold-hearted mercenary routine, but then he suddenly realizes, wait, what am I doing? I'm talking to a bunch of orphans right now. <laughs> so maybe he does... If you do those quests in the right order, then it makes sense. But if you 
don't than it is that odd detail of like five thousand old man. <laughs> uh, yeah, Edgar. Hey, uh, this is my this is my out. I gotta go. Kyle, why? Because I got I got a family. <laughs> All right, bye, Kyle. We'll miss you. Uh, I, wait, hold on. I do want to make sure that you guys talk about the fact that there is a character named Johnny who has terrible stomach issues uh, later in the game. So go into detail oh, yeah. on that, please. Okay, will do. Uh, we will impact Johnny. All right, please <laughs> clap out there, Kyle. So chapter eight. A lot of people wrote in about a lot of different things. I was surprised nobody wrote in about one of my favorite sections from this uh, section, which was the very opening of chapter eight, which is cloud falling uh, and the trippy vision sequence not the one that he has when he touches Aerith, but the one where sephiroth comes back uh so yes ronnie well so th this like this was a mystery that i always wondered is like who is talking in that like even so yeah. I, I feel like when when we for the celebration of final fantasy 7 got to that part we still ask, i feel like we asked that question of like like who else is talking here and, and that it's it's cloud it, it's, a, it's a different persona of Cloud. Right? right. And so, yes, in the original game, it's like a text box, Jeff. Um, and in this one, they really blow it out either with glitches, um, which they did earlier on of saying this is more than just a reactor. Um, but then for this section, actually having another version of Cloud talking to him, which is like my favorite Final Fantasy VII stuff is just some good trippy nonsense. But what do you think of that section, Jeff? Did that pop out to you at all? Yeah, it was weird. I I did not know what was going on. And then I figured it was just because he fell like a thousand feet and then was laying in some hallucinogenic flowers in a church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I love, uh, there's a moment then where the other Sephiroth, or see, the other Cloud turns into Sephiroth and Cloud says like, who are you? And he just goes, I am your everything. I was like, oh, that's so good. And yeah. then he goes, he has a line where he's like, oh, Cloud, there's so much to be done, which I'm sure will be a quote for future episodes and future uh, chunks of this remake to be released and stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. So like one thing um, about the fight with uh, Reno. Yeah. And the thing that happens afterwards is that, you know, Cloud like has this, this instinct to just execute him, right? Yes, yes. Uh, so and then there the is. The phantoms come by, and now now the phantoms are helpful. Well, yes. So Fred DeNovo says there was some debate last episode of Cloud is trying to kill people with the Johnny incident. Given the Reno scene, he is definitely out for some cold hearted blood. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I stand fully corrected because that is brutal. And like even Reno's has a line there where he's like, "Hey, you've got it all wrong, man." Uh, after Aerith saves Reno's life. Uh, Yes, and then the um, ghosts come back and they seem to be protecting them and guiding them this time around, which is wild. But the, yeah, but then also like protecting Reno. Oh, you think the ghosts protected Reno? Well, I, I, I don't know if, it, if they were particularly like protecting Reno, but I mean, they decided to show up at the millisecond that his sword was going to come down on Reno's face. Well, I think so, I think they were also like pulling Cloud and Aerith back. I think in my mind they were protecting Cloud and Aerith more than they were trying to save Reno's life in any way. Probably, but I I just wonder what the like like why why at that very moment because I, I do feel like it was a deliberate thing on the on on the Phantom side uh, that Reno stay alive, and it made me wonder like what what instrument are they like. Okay. Like what are they serving here? All right. Are you ready to to light a joint over there, Ron? Taylor Owens writes in, and he I think says, "I already know what this. Is. I've, I've been thinking a lot about this, but okay." Oh, I'm very curious to hear your take. I don't know what's going on. So Taylor Owens says, "Is this really a remake, or is it something weirder?" Let's talk about the flying black monsters. Though I hate their design, I screamed at my TV when they pulled Cloud and Aerith back through the doors of the church, and I realized what their deal is. They had intervened twice before. Once to fly around Aerith and draw Cloud's attention to her, leading them to meet. Then they hurt Jesse just enough that Cloud had to take her place in the mission that led to Cloud falling through Aerith's church. I think their purpose is to make sure the plot of the original game happens. 
Every time the remake threatens to change the original story, especially with Aerith, they put it back on track. The question is, if this is just a remake, why would that be necessary? So that is that is exactly the same thing that I thought of. Today. Really? That, that these phantoms are the ghost of the original. And they're preserving that. <laughs> that is some good, trippy stuff. You seriously had that same thought? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that was the thing. Like, because it, it just, it seems like those, those phantoms show up at very significant moments and they, they kind of, a, they direct the characters in a specific way. And that was the first time where like, man, that would be a huge thing if Reno were to die there. And that moment, like it, it just kind of felt like the Phantom said, nope, that's not happening here. And that felt very deliberate. Um, so that, that to me was the same thought that I had is that, th- this, that these Phantoms are somehow preserving Sephiroth's will on how things are supposed to go. That is a fascinating idea. Uh, it makes me think of like, well, it makes me think of Twilight Zone stuff in like the Jordan Peele series, which is a weird connection. Is that what that you thought? Is the same thing <laughs> that I had <laughs> with the oh Blurry Man God. episode. It's the same thing. <laughs> That's a very uh, obscure take, but yeah, I mean, I still don't know what they are. I certainly had the impression early on that they were connected to Marco. And the reunion folks, but you guys seem to be leaning away from that. And now, Grant, are you shifting one way or the other? I still think not connected to the the Marco stuff. Boy, Jeff, um, what's your take on the the ghastly goobers? No idea. I'm just pissed they wouldn't let me get that materia in the church. Yeah, that, that was bullshit. Uh, yeah. You know that you could go back to get it? No, you couldn't. Yes, you could. Uh, so when, when? I was... So it was when I was at Eris house, they're like, all right, are you ready to go to sleep or whatever the prompt was? And I said, no. And I looked at the map and, and then all the way back I ran the all the way back to the church. Cause I'm like, I remember there was a piece of yellow materia behind Reno's face and it's much wow. better than any chocobo material I could have got by a fan. And so I ran all the way back there. Got it. Guess what it was? What? What? Chakra. My favorite piece of materia. That thing okay. that Tifa already had equipped that so I never anymore. ever uh, use. Yeah. Thank you for letting me know that. Yeah, uh, it's very underwhelming. Overall. Yeah, but but that well, that, that's good to know. But I, at the end, once you got to that, uh, once you got to the sector, sector five or whatever, yeah, I tried to go back to the church and she wouldn't let me. Oh, interesting. I guess I yeah, it like forced spot. me to turn around. So it's annoying that you had to wait that long and then try again. But don't I guess do if it. It's just, yeah. Like, chocolate then i tried to go back once too and got tra- didn't think to go back a second time yeah uh i like that when you're looking at so the ghosts are like protecting Aerith, but it seems like the guards that are with reno can't see them and so they're talking and they go like they're trying to get near her and they can't they keep like bouncing off and they go like is this some kind of magic trick and it's really maybe stop and think too much about it of like in a world where magic exists everywhere, would the phrase magic trick exist? <laughs> like, what does that mean in the Final Fantasy VII universe? Um, let's see. Let's take one step back here and then two steps forward. Uh, Bob Buell says, so if you go to the door of the church before talking to Aerith, you hear a voice just named Question Mark, who is clearly Reno, saying, quote, hang back, we're in no rush. It's a nice subtle Easter egg showing that Reno and the soldiers were ready to burst down the door at all times. Uh and going back even further, Cameron Logan says, hey, guys, another fellow Roast fan here. Roast, 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 roast. Uh, <laughs> he says, Do- dozens of you out there. <laughs> Did anyone notice the insane vision Cloud had when Aerith touches him after he lands in the church? Um, she mentions her materia, if you recall. Yeah. Um, and this is very tough to talk about, but Cameron says, like, that vision is different than the other visions in a very confusing way. And he wonders what it means. Um, you're talking about like the tear moment, right? Nope. Nope. That's later on, nope. which we definitely want oh. to get to as well. This is the one where it's like a quick flash. And then they talk about um, Eris materia. And she's like, I've got special materia too. And Cloud's like, well, maybe you'll use it. See ya. It was a weird, and there's a, there's a flash of, from the original game. Okay. Anyways, we uh, can talk about it in a future spoiler thing at some point. Um, I just want to point out how amazing the church looked. And when you first get there and the fact that they have Eris theme on the piano, it's like, oh, Eris theme, great. 
And then it just keeps building on that piano till it feels like someone's just banging out Eris theme in the most amazing, beautiful way. Yeah. It's a great environment. Yeah, I, I just, I <laughs> we feel like we go back to the music quite a bit and just how it's just the best music in any video game ever. <laughs> um, and, and I wonder like just how, like it would be interesting to just like experience this game with just like the original soundtrack and like how different that would be because the the soundtrack seems to be so influential and just like how emotional things are and just like where the story's going. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? Actually, there's an interesting note here uh, that I think is up that alley. Tyler Carver says, okay, so I have no context for any of these characters because I've never played the original Final Fantasy VII, yet this game fun. has been making me oddly emotional. I find the interactions between the characters so compelling, and I feel like the game shines in these small character moments. From Cloud and Aerith picking flowers or walking along the rooftops, which reminded me a lot of Final Fantasy IX, to Cloud jumping onto the back of the carriage, uh, carrying tea front of the wall market, and she tells him, you know, I can kick some ass. These moments really establish these characters and making me fall in love with their interactions and cheer for their success throughout the game. All these things have become magnified as the musical score kicks in at just the right moment and really pulls on my heartstrings. Uh... Yeah, I'm so glad that so many people wrote in saying this is their first time playing through seven and still the music is unbelievable and that emotionally they're much more attached to the game than expected. Jeff, I'm curious to hear your your newbie take on yeah, this. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, Ronnie, you were joking about it being the, well, maybe you weren't joking that it was the best music of any video game. And honestly, like, I don't know what would come near it. And I don't, I don't have any of that nostalgia for any of these songs. But when you get an entire symphony to play and make right. just this amount of music and and cue everything up so well and then have everything flow so naturally it does it it has a profound impact on the entire experience and and kind of the cinematic nature and i i mentioned in a in the last episode i think that you know like a lot of times we i think we use cinematic too freely with video games and, and really it just means that it has a cutscene that looks pretty or something yeah but I, I think the storytelling in that it kind of evokes and makes you think about all these characters and everything that the music plays a huge part of that it, it's it's really validating to hear that like that that people that are new to the, the um, story are having these these sort of like emotional connections and experiences you know, in, in these interactions between the characters, because these characters, you know, for me are just like, so, and I, I always wonder just like, oh, that's, you know, and it is, it's, it's, it's 90% nostalgia, but to know that it's also like, you know, having that same impact on a, on a, you know, new generation or, you know, new players, it's just, it's awesome to hear that. Yeah. It's validating on yeah. several layers. And, you know, we don't have to dive into this moment too much, but talking about music, just hitting me one of the most emotional moments for this section was when you see the playground when you walk into the playground and yeah. the music oh my god it's just it is the first note from the intro the, like the intro that goes like dun 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 and it just you walk into the playground goes, dun, and it just holds one it note holds as long as you're in that that entrance as long as you're sitting straight up in your chair until you're just melted down on the floor in a heap <laughs> of your own tears. It is incredibly well done. Yeah. I'm glad that popped for you too. Uh, popped tears out of your eyes. Um, um, I, I mean, what did you guys think about that the whole playground? <laughs> Loved it. Um, uh, very good. Very good playground. Uh, somebody said in the comments that you can slide down the slide. Yeah. You? Yes, you can. I didn't do it. I'm furious with myself now. You're going to have, you're gonna have to go back. I have character thing that Cloud can do. <laughs> well, well, I'd argue there might be something else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, Bo Bakken says, the moment I first saw the big round playground slide thing, I made an audible gasp. It warmed my nostalgic, nostalgic cockles to experience that scene again of chatting on top of that dumb slide. Um, yeah, and she says that she used to sell flowers, sell flowers there before the plate fell which is interesting because i went back and looked at the opening video again to see if like she's in the background because that confirms them that okay that is that area obviously before the plate fell because they talk about that new detail about how chapter or sector six's plate fell during construction which is a very interesting detail that to throw in there for lore wise 
Um, I didn't want to say anything because I thought, wow, that's a huge detail that I must have missed. In, oh, in the first game. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember being in there either. No. Yeah. Um, but uh, what did you think about the the talk they had? Jeff, I'm, we'll ask you. Yeah. Um, so this is, this kind of gets to my, I, I understand how important that Aerith is as a character and that everyone is in love with her, but the, her, her personality is coming off real weird to me. And I don't, it, it was interesting to hear that Kyle thought she was mean, which is not, I haven't really gotten a mean vibe from her, but she, she just seems very aloof and, and kind of reminded me of like the Phoebe of final fantasy. <laughs> And I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, like, and as, as Cloud and Aerith spent more time together, I was kind of, she was, she was growing on me, but, uh, but that first, that first kind of section when you're, when you're running through what's basically another dungeon with all the mechanical, mechanical grab hand ass stuff going on. <laughs> That's right. She, she, she was just like, who is this weird, weird lady? And, and this is the lady that everyone is losing their minds over? Yeah, yeah, and that's I, I you know, <laughs> that almost feels kind of intentional. I, I, I feel like that's like we're in a space right now where we we still don't know a lot about about her past, and I think like coming from you know a person that's that's played the original game, like you you know that there's just more for more in her history that just kind of gives her that, that darker past. And you can, you can hear it once in a while, um, particularly in that scene where Cloud and Aerith were um, talking um, by her house about the flowers and just like that, that scene like holds, I, I think a lot of significance in terms of just like kind of how like tortured she is and alone she is um, that I think she's doing a lot to um, ignore that, hmm. that area of her, I, of her soul. I didn't really get a, a mean vibe by from her. Either. Um, she's slightly snarkier and a little bit more sarcastic. The amount of dialogue that she has in this version compared to the original is so much more fl- that it's essentially like having to rewrite her character in a way. Right. Uh, yes. Because she is talking so much more. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, uh, as Grant digitizes a little bit with his voice, Ron, you want to check the volume on your phone and see if there's a way to, to up that in any way uh, for your mic input? But uh, Seth Walker, uh, he says, Hey, guys, uh, like Ben, I was a little skeptical of Aerith's performance after her brief introduction in Chapter 2. Well, after playing through Chapter 8, I find that I love her more than ever. She had the innocence of a child, a heart of gold, and that perfect playful chemistry with Cloud. The voice actress, in my opinion, brings the perfect charisma to the character. Chapter 8 may be my favorite chapter yet, and it just hits the heart and tone of what I was looking for in the perfect Final Fantasy VII remake. Um, By and large, even though I feel like I've only read negative so far, people are in love with Aerith. And that was... Mm. I, I had a similar track with Seth where I was pretty skeptical and I saw a lot of people tweeting like, Aerith, best girl, best girl, she's the greatest. And I was like, ah, I don't know if it's going to hit it. And I think the key is that like, she's genuinely funny. And I think the writing yeah, pulls too. through in a lot of spots, which I never really got too much of in the original game. And I think she's handled in a really smart way. And I was I was wowed uh, by the end of the section in regards to Aerith, which I was not anticipating. Andrew Valla writes in, uh, and it seems- Wait. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> No, I, I wanted to uh, just just say a little bit about the uh, the playground scene. Yeah, the floor is yours. Oh, um, well, I, I just noticed that they they changed the dialogue to something like much more significant for Aerith. Um, she referred to the the first person that in in the game or in the original game, it's a, a person that she used to date. Yes. It reminds her of someone that she used to date, and in this one, it's this person or maybe the only person that I fell in love with. First person. You know, she says first person that I fell in love with instead of another person. Or the only, it's either like the first person or the only person that I, that I fell in love with. Okay. It was the, fir- it was the first person. Oh, she says. That, the first that's person? very interesting and notable. Um, yeah, that scene is really wild for just kind of putting things more on front street than I expected and that they did in the original, in the original version, you know, um, Joseph Vessel, uh, watched that scene and he said, wait, was Sephiroth Aerith's boyfriend? Which I was like, ooh, that's an interesting. I don't even know if I should read that. Uh, but then I remembered that there's another scene in Chapter 8 where Cloud's like, 
I love this scene where Klaus is like, wait, you don't know Sephiroth, do you? And Aerith is like, wait, that war hero that died five years ago? No. <laughs> he's like, okay, cool. It's like that weird little exchange. And so, um, no, it is not. But I love that idea. And it's crazy right. then where she's like, yeah, he was in Soldier First Class. And Cloud is so cavalier about like, oh, what was his name? I bet I knew him. And there's like, <laughs> like electrocuting his brain. Uh, and then she actually says the character's name, but it's like a perfect, well, it's a perfect lip oh, read. Right. And they cut out the audio because the cloud is too busy glitching out, which is yeah. amazing. All, like, especially from the sake of localization, the fact that like they get that mouth perfect where it's like, she says the thing and yep. it's amazing. Uh, Jeff, mm. um, did that scene have an impact for you at all? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know what she was supposed to be saying either, and I did wonder the Sephiroth thing too at that point. Oh, interesting. Did you get that scene? I think it was in a side quest in Chapter Eight where Cloud asked yeah. her. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then I didn't think it after that, but. Okay, gotcha. That's very interesting. Also, she um right when Cloud crashes to the church, there's an interesting line too, and I know this is a lot of dancing on the original, and I'm sorry, but when he uh, crashes to the church, she's like, "Oh, you're in Soldier." He's like. How'd you know? She's like, ah, oh, your sword. <laughs> He's like, oh, okay. Ah. Moving on. Uh, so Jonathan Fenn says, uh, Aerith scolding you for stepping on the flowers during the Reno fight was a real highlight for me. Yeah. That was fun. And I was trying to think like, oh, are we actually going to tear them up? Should I try and avoid them? I was doing my best to try and stay mm -hmm. off them, but it was a tough fight. Reno was faster than I thought he was going to be. So you know what? You got to get around. Uh, Derek Maldonado says... I just want to point out that if you face the camera correctly during the church fight, you can see Aerith jump and cheer for when you defeat one of the grunts in the park before Reno steps in. Yeah. Adorable. Uh, ENT Clark says the Reno boss fight at the beginning of chapter eight totally kicked my butt. I basically had used all my items on the previous boss fight against Kyle's hype bot in chapter seven. After losing four times in a row against Reno, I was starting to get frustrated. Up until this point in the game, I hadn't really had to use R1 to block or parry. This fight forced me to use the systems that the game has available, and I'm now finding combat a lot more engaging. I yeah, had the exact same experience. I, I wrote down the same note that it really doesn't reinforce that mechanic. Yeah, and yeah. it wasn't until my second playthrough of Chapter 4, second or third, I forget, um, that I understand for the footage for last week, I was completely blowing it by not using that parry for the Rose fight, and now it's like, well, it's just so incredibly important, especially with Reno. So it seems like any physical attack, it's like just get mm -hmm. ready to be in Punisher mode, and it's just the cat's pajamas there. But I love that multiple people hit a brick wall of difficulty, and then they just had to stop, pay attention, learn the system. And I think that's the mark of right. good game design. Like, I love the challenge level of this game. I've died a couple times, but I like it. I like having to focus a little bit more than the average RPG here. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, I, that was, uh, yeah, one of those things where, um, yeah, I had used all of my, like, I, I maybe had, like, a few high potions, and that was about it, and I didn't have any, like, heal materia, I think, on on Cloud, and so, like, I had to really pay attention with that with that Reno battle and, like, dodge you know, when he, he would charge in and then he would leave himself open. And, and so, yeah, it, it just, it, it really highlighted that like, yep, you can probably brute strength your way through this fight if you want to, or you can really like break it down and minimize the use that you have on your items and probably have a little bit more fun too. And just figuring out what that fight, you know, includes. Yeah. And Reno overall, I think it's really interesting to see how the characterization so far uh, these characters are from the original version, Jeff. Um, and in the Final Fantasy VII Advent Children movie, they take Reno and turn him into one of the Three Stooges, basically. And so mm. it's fascinating <laughs> to see that in this game, he seems to be not like a straight-laced character, but not all goof. He's just kind of like a slightly loose suit, which I think is like a perfect tone for Reno compared to yeah. bleh, in, in Advent Children tripping over his shoelaces or whatever the hell happened in that film. Like, I think also like Advent Children's like post story and everybody's a little bit more stronger. And... <laughs> Wait, so Reno's just <laughs> drunk or what are you getting at? Never mind. Okay. Uh, so... <laughs> what did you think of the voice actor for Reno? I guess he didn't stand out to me too much. What'd you think? Uh, his was one of the first ones where the voice didn't line up with what I had in mind for a character in my head, I guess, as a kid. Mm. I had that with Rude a little bit, where it was like his voice was a little bit deeper and calmer than I was expecting. Really? See, for yeah. him, he fit perfectly. I thought, this, this I, is I, Rude. I, <laughs> I thought Rude fit perfectly as well. Uh, yeah. But Reno, Reno didn't like stick out to me as 
like that it was off. It, it just, it, it didn't ring any bells for me. Um, yeah. I, well, that's a great I still think, <laughs> I still think for me that uh, the voice actor for Sephiroth is the most fitting. Yeah. And I hadn't really thought of what he would sound like that much, I guess. Um, but I think they just nailed it. Something about the, the calm, but I think I said it last episode, calm, but menacing. It's just, yeah, it's yeah. Perfect. Calm with yeah, a K. Uh, Time Bomb Tom says, how did everyone feel about the switch from dropping the barrels in the original to cutting chandeliers in this one? Within the, next, <laughs> within, the, within the next two areas, one in the church and one in the scrapyard, there are, oh, the yellow materia thing is what he brought up. Um, and Dennis also went back for that chakra materia, which was pissed. He was pissed about. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I didn't mind losing the barrel dropping overall because we all know it's impossible in the original game. But uh, <laughs> but the part that killed me is like when you're attacking the chandelier, hanging like that. And then when I was getting shot by those soldiers, not being able to do anything, I hated that feeling. Yeah. I'm pissed. I want barrels back. Yeah. Give us our barrels square. You hear us? You hear us? <laughs> uh, Scott Castro says, I audibly laughed when Aerith directs you to take the long route from the station to get to Sector 5 slums in order to avoid the Turk, and she just matter-of-factly says, quote, there will be monsters. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's a wacky world. I do like that idea of, like, you get used to a certain tone with this game. And then it's just like, oh, by the way, yeah, there's crazy goons out there. It's like, hey, what's going on? Goblins. <laughs> you wouldn't believe yeah. these freaks. Yeah, like, like uh, one of my favorite moments, I think, so far with with uh, the food just Cloud and Aerith interaction is just that moment where she's like climbing up a ladder and she's again making this this like assertion. She's like, you know, I'm I'm fine. I'm like, I can take care of myself. I'm and not a princess that, that needs to be coddled. Oh, is that it? And, yep. and then, and then the, the ladder just breaks and she just says, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. I, love but, that. I mean, think about how hard they try and push certain characters on you in some games and they, they don't pop, they don't click. And then it's like, you know what we need to be into a character and not like falling in love with her. It's like, oh, she's cool. Is a moment like that. Just that quick yeah. little thing. Or even like when she's walking across the platform and you're behind her and she's like, well, well, and there's like, oh, you're falling. And she's like, oh, I got it. Like she's like her level of <laughs> fucking with you, I think is a beautiful and level to yeah. make you um, fall in love with her. Um, so <laughs> that's a weird thing with that. You know, I'm not a princess it needs to be coddled. There's a little bit coming from her. And then also with Tifa about like, I'm not a damsel in distress, you know, and it's a weird thing where it's like a modern layer over the skeleton of Final Fantasy VII, which still has a lot of that in it of like, oh, we need to come rescue the princess. You know, so it's like, but they're trying to like make it feel a little bit more powerful by having them mm -hmm. verbally acknowledge that they're not princesses, even though the core of the plot requires they be damsels in distress. Yeah, I, I, but I mean, like, they're not, I don't know, like, like I haven't, I haven't, seeing them be damsels in distress in, in that way where, you know, that they're helpless. I, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like there's there's still a lot of power yeah. between Aerith and, and Tifa. Well, I hear you, but then think about, you mean, like, the Tifa scene. And I know it's kind of Aerith being like, hey, we need to go help her. This is messed up, what she's going to do uh, to go yeah. into Corneo's mansion. Yeah, but then to not to jump ahead too much, but when you get to that point, like, Tifa and Aerith just kick ass together and, yeah. and pretty much take care of everything themselves you know yeah that's just, a good point just because just because cloud kind of falls for it that he has to be the one to go save them i appreciate that that didn't actually turn out to be the case as much as as much as at least as much as they could have made that you know yeah right and the way that i interpreted like that moment was actually where Aerith was just like looking for any excuse to mm. stay along with cloud and like this was a perfect opportunity to be like all right yep let's go over here Rather than have that moment of like, okay, well, we're, I guess this is it. Yeah. So, yeah. And just to get to that moment here, Dennis M says, how amazingly good was the scene when Tifa and Aerith teamed up to get Cloud in the Corneo mansion? By the way, Corneo, well, apparently, not Corneo. Um, he says, the music, which is a remix of the themes of Tifa and Aerith, was an absolute banger. The performances and the animations were top notch. And the icing on the cake was when Aerith with that WWE style chair shot to the head. <laughs> I uh, love that. It was very <laughs> excellent. And I love too. Like when you first walk up to that mansion and talking to the guards and they're like, ah, Aerith, she's a, she's homely, but cute. And Aerith is like, excuse you? 
And then yeah. they keep talking about like, yeah, yeah. she's fine looking. And then Aerith goes, permission to kill. And then Cloud just right. says, denied. Real quick. Like I, <laughs> That level of writing I did not expect from the remake. It is just perfect. Uh, they were missing missing one thing in that Corneo scene. Um, they needed one guy walking around the room and thrusting towards you. Um, You're right. Yeah. I, I don't know what happened. Uh, they lost him now. It's a real shame. <laughs> Yeah, I was really curious is. how they're going to handle that. And it's amazing like how, I guess we're talking about Corneo, let's get into it. Um, it's amazing how they kept it relatively lighthearted for a pretty effed up scene in the original in a lot of ways. And then they just hit you with, we're being gassed, we're losing consciousness. It's like, oh my God. Like they went from, <laughs> okay, you're walking that tight line of it being silly, but not too dark to now we're just gassing women and dragging them into this other room. It's like, all right, well now you got a lot more to deal with, Square. But- yep. In the end, you know, Corneo's a bit much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That sounds about right. <laughs> and that's a stance the I'm... of him is to be this insane and eccentric guy. I think one of the greatest things that they did in this uh, chapter was to temper him by showing, like, the community's response to him. Like, his, his foremost henchman doesn't like him. Um, all three of these guys that are are, are um, sort of providing him with women are all in 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 ways just kind of like kind of undermining him in 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 different ways. So like, I I, I really liked. I mean, we got that I, I, we got that from Leslie, but did you get that from any of the other guards? Well, I, I I think I think Sam gave him just like a heads up, like, hey, I can't help you with this, but I'm telling you right now, you can do the thing that you want to do. Um, you, you guys remember that? No, do yeah. the thing you want to do. What yeah. Do you mean? yeah, yeah. I mean, like w- when you get done with the arena fight, like the last arena fight, he said, "Like, like, are you gonna help me?" He's like, "No, but I'm gonna tell you right now that you, what you want to do, you can do, given like who you are and the skills that you have. Mm. You don't need help from me." Right. Right. Yeah. But then you the go to the door. Lady... Oh, sorry, go on. Uh, he tells you. He basically insinuates that you could go in there and, you know, rip up Corneo's mansion if you want to. Then the guards immediately shut you down. Like, you sure you want to do that? I don't think you know what you're in for. He was even, that guy, I I don't remember his name. I really like Leslie. 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 He was providing counsel in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, And and just kind of saying, like, I understand what you want to do. I don't, like, advise for this. And knows that that Cloud is going in there. Let's him in there anyways. I yeah, mean, I, I I love that, and I actually got like it was sad at the end that his whole thing was like, I, I kind of helps you here. Here's your gear, just finish this, and they didn't. They couldn't finish it. They couldn't kill Corneo. You mean? Yeah, yeah. And I think I think Leslie's whole thing was like, yeah, I I like I acknowledge that Corneo is he's evil, and uh, like I don't want him here in my community. So you guys are the first competent people to do this kill him and yeah. i couldn't and I, yeah i that, i really i really like that that character and how they they kind of built that up where where at first when you first see him he just seems like another jerk bodyguard right. who's standing in your way and then eventually by the end he's helping you out and giving you your stuff back and yeah and undermining his boss yeah uh, joe holasco says i was wondering how cloud and the, uh, the group would get their equipment back. It didn't occur to me that Leslie would help bring it to them. And then Alan Liebold comments and he says, yeah, I think Leslie is an interesting character worth discussing. Worth discussing. You get the impression right away that there's some backstory there with his attitude and the way he warns you about Corneo. I also liked how he immediately recognizes Cloud wearing the dress and is just like, fine, whatever, go ahead. It was a really nice surprise. Uh, there's a lot going on for a character that really didn't need to be anything more than door guard number one, I think is a great mm-hmm. way to put it for yeah. Alan. Like they really went above and beyond in all these big ways. Uh, Travis Manick... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, sorry. Question for you, Ben. Please. Did anybody mention uh, when we replayed the, the opening scene of uh, the PS1 game, but yeah. the PC version? Uh, wasn't there some debate whether Tifa, Cloud, and Aerith reference them versus it for what yeah. they're going to do to them or it? That's oh. right. And, and now we finally... Didn't this... Because in the original PS1, it was them. PC, it was it. And now we're back to them, <laughs> right? No, I think I think it's the opposite. I think in the oh. PC port, I think it's them. And I think really? people remember it being it. 
I do believe. I thought we were, I thought we were surprised in the PC port that it they referenced it and not them. I always thought it was them. In the original? Yeah. As in I thought so too. Testicles. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, I I read this as the same as the version we played uh, for the stream not too long ago. Gosh, I thought it was the opposite. I don't know. It's I'm complicated. I'm losing it. That's fine. Uh, Justin Swart wrote in saying, I found the whole interaction with Don Corneo, Corneo at the end of Chapter 9 very off-putting. Him asking Cloud to give him some sugar and the rest of his dialogue regarding women uh, was eye-roll inducing. Is he wanted to make him unlikable. Mission accomplished, but perhaps not in the intended way. I think that was the intended way. I think that's <laughs> yeah. yeah. absolutely the intended way. And then I mean, Justin says, a, "Just a, a vile little <laughs> douchebag." Yeah. Uh, to, uh, to follow that up, Cloud, Aerith, and Tifa threatened to cut, rip, and smash his quote beans. I'm not sure if that is a reflection <laughs> of their supposed juvenile age or just a bad joke that didn't land for me. Add it all up, and I was very happy that that long chapter was over for Justin. I'm sorry, Justin. You can unsubscribe. <laughs> no, you can't. Ah, <laughs> uh, oh, man, that's. It, that, yeah, I, that's uh, that was such a highlight. That uh, chapter nine was such a highlight for me. And why um, do you think it was a highlight? Um, it, it was okay. There were a, a lot of new characters that we got to interact with that were fun, and like <laughs> I, I, I liked the new characters, and I liked them all. Like um, even Johnny, who was you know, you know, pretty obnoxious, um, still was just kind of like okay, like. He's fine. <laughs> the other guys, um, like, like the, the three, um, I found to be delightful. Yeah, I liked every one of them because it, I mean, they, it's so stupid and over the top. But it gets back to yeah, this feels like a thing from Final Fantasy VII. This is the tone of Final Fantasy VII, and it's yeah. relatively quick. It's not like you're really soaking in these guys debating the English language for too long. No, not really. Yeah, I mean it's yeah, but they're memorable. They're very memorable characters. They they took an area of the original game that was six shitty little buildings and flesh it out into this like the area this, this area that they built up as a place where you can get or attain anything you want and it felt so alive with the music in there uh the neon lights everything i, I loved the reimagined wall market it, it hit every note for me that it should yeah you know what's yeah, weird I, I feel like they took some of the magic and vibe of like the gold saucer and kind of brought it forward. Maybe it's just like the music in particular into this section of having like even the arena. You know, I feel like there's so many elements where it's just kind of like slide this sucker up and then to have this big splashy area. But I agree, it's incredible. Um, yeah, I, I definitely was thinking about the golden saucer arena when in the the wall yeah. market arena too. That was that was really cool. Yeah. But even, even the color schemes, I mean, of the arena was indicative of the one in, in, in gold saucer. So I, I don't think that was unintentional. Yeah. Uh, Zach Galou says, where do I even start with wall market? This was by far my favorite part of the game so far. I didn't want it to end the way they preserved a lot of the minor NPCs, like the materia shop owner and the sleazy guy outside the inn while bringing new characters to the forefront, like Chocobo Sam and Madam M really give the wall market such an incredible sense of place for what had to be the longest chapter so far. I really wish I could have spent more time in, in wall market. Yeah. That's the crazy thing is like, Wandering around that place and just being like, oh my God, they blew it out in such a big way. Where am I? What is this? And then you go in this door and it's like, oh my God, it's the guy sitting down in this materia shop. Or it's like, oh my God, <laughs> yeah. this is the room. It's the guy enshrined, the guy that built his whole freaking building to just enshrine himself. Yes. So lay down <laughs> and do his business. Or I you walk in that. and then it's like, oh, here's the Gatling gun weird item thing that they say, oh, it must be broken. It's just like yeah. these flashes of nostalgia when you don't expect it because you feel like you're exploring this bigger living city overall it's just incredible when you know the original one in particular the, the really here. weird thing is um the amount of side quests in wall market like i've never felt in a portion of a game god i'd love some more side quests right now yeah i would have done right. more there happily yeah yeah but this this remake is hitting it so on the nose that when i walked into that restaurant and the guy even said the, the 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 line, "Hey, sit anywhere you like." I was disappointed that there wasn't only one seat open. <laughs> like that's that's the level of detail where I'm like, "Oh, okay, well they didn't get that." That's right. The best I got. Yeah, I guess I didn't order anything there. Can you get the Korean barbecue like you can in the original game? I hope so. I didn't try. Did you do all the side quests? Uh, I thought so. Didn't did did Johnny eat something there? 
No. Did I miss yeah, side I, quest in chapter I had nine? Johnny, I had Johnny eat something there. Johnny ate something there. Is this uh, what Kyle was talking about, where Johnny eats something and then uh, poops his pants like Metal Gear Solid Johnny? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> now I'm really confused. I thought I did all the side quests in chapter Yeah, and then nine. you have to go get medicine for him, and it's a whole thing. I did you not know, do like, that. You know what those like green exclamation points mean on your minimap? <laughs> How's that? Okay, this is what people are talking about. These side quests. Um, so Andrew Valla uh, says, a couple of fun items I found while exploring Wall Market. You can find Johnny's father at various points in Wall Market throughout the chapter. At the end of the chapter, you find him drunk in one of the Honeybee Inn's rooms right, trying to yeah. guess the shape of one of the Honeybee girls uh, that they're trying to make with her stinger. Uh, you can also peek into one of the Honeybee Inn suites to see Palmer chasing a Honeybee girl with a giant-sized novelty swatter. I did not see that, but that's amazing. If I, missed that, I missed that one, too. I didn't check the other oh, rooms. Oh, wow. So yeah. Damn if, it. If you walk back into the Honeybee Inn after the dance number, you can talk to Andrea, and he'll tell you your equipment will be delivered to the appropriate time. Uh, if you check in on Johnny's father after the dance, he'll pass out in the same room you found him before the show. And if you peek through the keyhole again, instead of Uncle Palmer chasing a honeybee girl, one of the ladies is chasing a man around the room with a giant hypodermic needle laughing maniacally. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, absurd. Do you guys all find the teacher or the mm -hmm. the head orphan lady? Yes, Folia. in like the back yeah. alley. Uh, yes, Miss Folia. Uh, yes. Yeah. Let's see. Who is it? Dennis M. says, you guys discover Miss Folia, the teacher from Orphanage in Sector 5, is secretly a honeybee girl. You can find her in the alley right next to the honeybee inn. She was pretty embarrassed when Cloud realized it was her and told him not to tell the kids. And then Lauren Gaming says, uh, being able to see the different facets of those two characters' lives uh, it was such a great touch talking about Miss Olivia and then also Biggs. Efforts like these really make uh, the game's world feel more alive in this remake. Um, and that's that weird connection where in chapter eight, she reveals that the teacher before her that she learned so much from was actually Biggs, which is... Yeah, that was that was wild. Yeah. And a lot of yeah. people commented on how weird it was that Cloud did not react in any way. <laughs> Nothing. He's a, he's a cool customer. What are you going to do? Uh, I Maybe I skipped some Johnny stuff then. It must you be. must have. That's very frustrating. Um, uh, well, one last thing on chapter eight. Yeah. Uh, when Rude replaces his glasses that broke, is yes. that was that in the original game or is that a nod to um, the agent from the Matrix? No. Oh, I thought it was. I, I I felt like maybe I'm totally off. I thought that was in Advent Children. I, it's an Advent Children thing. Oh, okay. And maybe it's also in the Matrix. I'm trying to remember. But yeah, I remember we talked about it in Advent Children. Uh, but people really love that bit overall. I did too. That was a fun fight. Yeah. Do you want to go back to Chapter 8 and try and work through this thing chronologically, even though we're already all over the place? Um, I, I think it's, yeah, I, I think it's great to just kind of like make sure that we're hitting all the big beats in each chapter. Yeah. That's this is the deepest dive. Yes. Uh, Jesse Spencer really wanted to call out, and a lot of people did, that they absolutely adored walking across the Sector 5 rooftops with Aerith. From oh, the conversation so cool. to the music, that. the feeling that I had, the opportunity to watch two characters I grew up loving get to know each other, after all, once again, put a smile on my face. Uh, and Eric Seal, oh, great comment here, Eric. He says, the sweetest, most sincere moment in the game for me thus far is when Cloud is escorting Aerith across the slum rooftops. He warns Aerith of a particularly narrow ledge, and I was 100% certain she was going to continue their quippy rom-com banter. Instead, she responded, gotcha, thanks. I honestly choked up. Earnest gratitude between characters just isn't something I'm used to seeing in a video game. The fact that it was one from characters that I know and love so well is icing on the cake. Game of the year. Lock it in, says Eric. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Um, and and uh, I, I also, I, I love that, that, um, you know, these characters aren't one-dimensional in, in that way and they, they have these moments of just like like yeah they've, they've been a while or they've been doing a thing together for a little bit and then it just goes to hey watch out for that thing yep okay gotcha thanks I, I love that yeah i mean my big takeaway was like well i didn't think they could nail it but they nailed the relationship between cloud and Aerith in my mind i know that other people apparently newcomers are maybe a little less won over jeffum says take her or leave her which i thought was a bit strong, but mm -hmm. uh, Yara wrote in and says, I love the playful banner between Aerith and Cloud in chapter eight. Whenever they fight mobs, Cloud goes that Cloud, Cloud tells them that the monsters focus on weaker people first and Aerith responds, oh. you should watch out then, which elicits a <laughs> chuckle from Cloud and it's quite heartwarming. 
Uh, Rob Hudak. You uh, also catch that thing where she says, like, man, the, the monsters must be a new breed. And he's like, how do you figure? And he says, because they attack me first. Right, right. <laughs> love that. Uh, Rob says, I love, 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 love the high five gag that runs throughout the Sector 6 tunnels and its culmination into a whole triangle prompt at the end. But she deserved both hands, damn it. Aerith is just the sweetest. <laughs> yeah, the fact that within the span of like an hour of game time, Cloud's like, eh, 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 <laughs> give somebody a high five to turning into James Brown on the stage. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. whatever. I, I, did, I did like the moment like kind of halfway through that gig where he goes to do it and, and she just kind of, she isn't ready for it. So she doesn't yes. see it. And he's like, oh, never, never mind. I, I wasn't doing anything. Right. right. And just tries to play it off like that. That was funny. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Valla is getting to a theme that you were hitting earlier, Ronnie. He says, I love how Aerith is portrayed as a hopeful character without being passive or airheaded. She's a strong character that chooses to be positive despite a loss, a life of loss and hardships. Yep. Which I think is very well put. Um, Adam Dominguez <laughs> says, Aerith is a star of the game for me. A lot of us grew up in concrete jungles like Midgar, all that ugliness that's involved with city life, the smells, the gutters, the trash, the sounds. It used to get to me as a kid. And in 1997, Aerith talked straight to my dumb kid heart and let me know that I could find beauty even in the ugliness of Oakland, California. All that is flooding back into my jaded old brain as I got to hang out with the flower girl again. That's amazing. That's, yeah, that, that's awesome. And I love... Did anybody uh, comment on the parallels between Tifa of her sector and Aerith of her sector. Interesting. Uh, well, what's your theory? There's something that's closely related to that. Well, they're both just like the rock star of their sector. Oh, uh, as you right. walk around with both of them, everybody has to make a comment on what they're up to, how sweet they are, who's this guy she's, that they're with. Um, yeah. It was it was very similar reactions for both of them. Yeah. We very Both very involved in their community. Yeah. And although, very giving and... Yeah, I feel like Aerith was kind of steering Cloud towards like, oh, I guess we'll swing by the orphanage real quick. Oh, I guess I'm a rock star here on this first date. Oh, big whoop. Oh, what's going on over there? Oh, I'm a rock star over here, too. Uh, Jonathan, Very long. Yeah. Jonathan Quevedo says, Welp! They captured Aerith as well as I remembered her in Final Fantasy VII. She was always portrayed like some vir virginal, virginal, uh, white mage girl. <laughs> But she's actually We're way more, yeah. she's actually way more crass, coy, and occasionally dirty. Hang on. The dirty thing is interesting. There was a moment. Am I reading too much into this where she, where Cloud's like, are all these houses abandoned? Like around the church? And she's like, Yeah, no one could hear us if we made all the sound in the world. And it's like, what is this? <laughs> anyways, anyways, so Jonathan says, She's more confident than Tifa and less innocent than she appears. Tifa and Aerith yeah. are always a contradiction in how they look versus who they are. Tifa appears to be a sporty tomboy, but she is more of a soft spoken, unsure. Soft spoken and unsure. Aerith appears ladylike and innocent, but she is more crass and sure of herself. I think that's a very easy way to boil down these characters that I've never really no, thought I, of I, before. I, I love that point. I, I think that's that's right on the nose there. Yeah. She, yeah, I, I, you're totally right. Like, Aerith is just more confident. And you see that right away in their um, in their first interaction where, you know, it, like, I was really looking forward to seeing that moment where, like, Aerith and, T and Tifa finally have this, this interaction together. And it's just, like, it feels like they just, like, hit it off. Where, like, Tifa was, in this moment, was just like, who, who is this? woman and like kind of immediately like took to her yeah and, and Aerith to tifa as well and i like i, I think that's going to be a lot of fun uh, moving forward here well i love it too because i think there's a line where tifa's like oh we can't have Aerith tag along like we gotta finish this mission on our own cloud and, and then like, and then cloud's like you're not gonna be able to tell her no and then tifa's yeah. like okay <laughs> yeah. i guess you're cool She's then already like, established that yeah um edgar vasquez wrote in and he said, I was very critical of the dialogue and writing in the first section, you might recall. It was bad, and I stand by that. <laughs> You're wrong, Edgar, <laughs> but thank you. He says, but my God has it improved immensely with Aerith. It's been like a night and day change. Most of Aerith and Cloud's interactions are genuinely heartwarming. The part where Aerith asked Cloud who gave, who he gave the flower to was amazing. Uh, yeah, I love that too, because in the first game, it is kind of obnoxious how much of like a teenager she feels like about like do you have another girlfriend cloud t he he whoa 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 but i feel like that was a very smooth way of asking you about it and it felt natural to me about her just being like yeah who'd you give that flower to anyway and he's like oh i don't know i forget yeah. she's like you liar you said you didn't lie um and uh he says we have the best line in the game already hands down says edgar vasquez it's when cloud says 
Tifa's talking about how well Cloud nailed the dress and the makeup, and Cloud goes, nailed it. I know. Thank you. Moving on. Uh -huh. 100%. <laughs> it I, is. I wrote it down. It was like one of the only quotes that I've written down in my notes, and that's what I was just looking at was how great that line is. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. I wrote that one down, too. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so moving through the slums, Andrew King says, as we traveled through the slum from church to Aerith's house, I was struck by how pretty the team at Screen Enix was able to make rusty metal and dirt. Uh, I loved it. And like, you know, I guess if you really want to overanalyze it, at a certain point you can see like when the piles of junk are just like one big mat. But the amount of variety they pack in there is incredible. There's like tanks. There's one part where there's huge mechs. There's like huge bullet shells that are just humongous. It's incredible. Uh... Somebody said it was a miracle that uh, they all didn't get tetanus uh, walking through there. Um, Kevin has a thought. Would you like to hear Kevin's thought? Yes, please. Kevin no. says, yes, sir. I'm sorry, Ronnie. We'll move on to Hyperlight Blossom. No. Kevin <laughs> says, uh, when they replay the video of the people responsible for the explosion at Reactor 5, they blame Avalanche, and it shows a video of Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse. They didn't show any footage of Tifa, Cloud, or Barrett. Wedge and Jesse right. wasn't even there for the second reactor. Are they trying to single them out or blame them only for some reason? It is weird. Yeah, no, it, it is weird. I, I I didn't think about that. Um, my 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 gut says I don't think so, but I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Hyperlight Blossom uh, says, walking through a street in Sector 5, I heard an old man telling the kids he was part of the construction crew that built the discs. After talking to a quest giver, I walked back down the street and heard those kids say, I wish I was alive back then to help build the discs. That would have been so cool. This was such a natural implementation of dynamic dialogue. I wasn't forced to stand and listen to a whole conversation, but rather the conversation is presumed continued in my absence. As if Midgar isn't brought to life enough by stunning visuals, little touches like that make the experience completely surreal. Dennis M. says, I would like to hear your theories on two of the biggest mysteries of the game. What exactly are the flying black ghost thingies that are really starting to interfere in the story? And who in the world could the angel of the slums be? We don't know. We'll never know who the angel of the slums be. It's a mystery as old as time. Uh, Chris Bartlett says... Wait, you're not going to... You know, hang on, hang on, hang on. Does anybody have any idea who the angel of the slums is? I mean, it's Marielle or whatever that stupid old lady is, right? Sure seems like it. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. the thief, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Ronnie, do you have a? I, you gonna crack the case? <laughs> I got. I kind of thought it was gonna be Aerith. I thought it was too, but even now, you think it's gonna be Aerith? I don't know. It's just like Angel of the Slums. Like, okay, well, it's probably Aerith. No, I'm sorry. Dennis is joking because it's so fucking obvious. Who <laughs> Angel of the Slums is. Screw <laughs> 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 you, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Got old Sco Scooby and the gang on the case here, dude. <laughs> uh, let's see. More about those slums. <laughs> oh, God. Where was I? There's too many notes. <laughs> where are we? Uh, okay. Chris Bartlett says, when Aerith was talking to Cloud... I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. When Aerith... <laughs> When Aerith was taking Cloud to the orphanage, she started walking ahead of me as we approached and nonchalantly walked through all the stools and the outside tables, knocking them over. Real smooth, <laughs> Aerith. Have you, she's, she's wondering if we've seen anything unintentionally funny. Uh, I don't know. That does this, sound hilarious. That. <laughs> Just like, yeah, these are my slums. I don't know. I kind of make home here. <laughs> marches through all their stuff. Scott Castro says, what kind of orphanage is Miss Folia running? The kids emulating Cloud with wooden swords is cute and all, uh, but the one kid in the orphanage has a spiked nail bat on his back? This is dangerous <laughs> as hell! He uh, made it. That nail bat. It's one of those things where, like, when, when that kid gave it to you, it's like, oh, of course that's how they include the nail bat. To have it make narrative sense this. in the world of Final Fantasy VII is, like, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, also, I, I like the powers at Disorder, where, like, you shift your forms uh and it goes with like a bigger stronger attack but just the sounds of the nail bat are so excellent oh my god the, like like the weight they nailed the weight of the nail bat down so well like where he does that 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 swing and then like people go flying when you hit them yeah i love that uh, i might have i might have missed out um because i got the nail bat and then i had to play the smashy boxy game that's right and it was so slow uh, that I switch back to the whatever the the second weapon is. I forget the name of it. Yeah, can't remember you. And I never went back. Um, 
Oh, I, I, I'm a speed over power guy, apparently. Interesting. I mean, the nail bat's fun to use for a while, but definitely when yeah. I had the option to get once, another weapon, I was like, oh, F that. Of course I want out of this. Yeah, no, yeah. Once I had the opportunity to get the hard edge, it's just like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There's a huge power upgrade in, in the hard edge as well. Yeah, that thing is fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Hey, Ronnie, can you lower the volume on your phone a little bit? No. Okay, great. Uh, Caleb Murray says, so in the Section 5 slums, Orphan House, in the back room on the chalkboard, there is several children's drawings of a chocobo, a moogle, and a cactar, which is all fine and good. But then there's a drawing of a tonberry? <laughs> How in the world does a Sector 5 orphan know what the hell a tonberry is, much less what one looks like? Aren't they supposed to be super rare, not to mention extremely dangerous? I assume tonberries are like wolves you know in like children's book stories like real and dangerous but mm. it's part of like the lexicon right there, there's there's absolutely a children's story with uh that features a tonberry yeah tom yeah. the tonberry or something I, I mean kids real life kids know what lions look like right doesn't mean that they've have you ever run asked, across have, them on Jeff the way them, to school Jeff or anything Jeff Jeff just put that to bed so yeah have you ever yeah. asked one ask the ask the lion or ask the kid ask the kid about um, how they've seen a line yeah go to the maybe, next letter maybe they don't know that's all i'm saying neil brown says when you get to the little kids hangout there's a girl standing there holding a yellow flower and saying pretty flower pretty blue flower why won't you talk to me something along those lines neil says i just stood there looking at the yellow flower wondering why they gave her a yellow flower for a blue flower voice line just a weird thing that took me out of the game for a minute and then nick l replied to Colorful. neil and said if you talk to her again she even starts picking other flower cow other flower colors including yellow so it's it's more dynamic than you think this game this game has it all everybody eric reed what's that they thought of it they thought of it <laughs> eric reed writes in and says how many times a day do you think moggy the moogle kid gets beat up <laughs> <laughs> hey man he's making a difference alive. <laughs> it's just trying to I mean, put on a good show. Hey, hey, newcomer. No more than Chadley, though, right? <laughs> well, I don't know. If Chadley is harnessing gods, he must have some secret stuff going on. Uh, in VR. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't I'm matter. Show you in VR. I am a god. Here, put these goggles on. Kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Micah Martin says, shout out to that kid in Sector 5 who dressed up as a Moogle and opened up a shot. Uh, he was cute and delightful, and, and meeting him was legitimately one of the highlights of the game so far for me. <laughs> but where does he get his wares? Uh, yeah, I like that weird bit of lore where he's like, only the people of the purest heart can see Moogles. I think like Cloud says that. Where it's like, oh, that's a fun idea, because I guess they're not really in 7. But then even acknowledging that idea of, well, there's the legendary fairy tale about Mog the Moogle. It's like, okay, right. so is that the basis for a character later on? Like, it's all filling things in in the world in a very fun way. Uh, I also like that kid, too, where Cloud's talking to him, and he's like, oh, Moogles can make everybody happy. And then Cloud literally says, make me happy. Make me smile from ear to ear. It's like <laughs> just a weird cold dare to that kid. Uh, okay. <laughs> like, it's it's going to be going to need a lot of tokens for that. <laughs> <laughs> Darkfish Day says, I've enjoyed looking for all the Moogle medals, but some of the appeal has been lost now that I know I can earn every one, earn one every time I play Whack-A-Box. And then Forrest yeah, Gerlach. Yeah, you have to play Whack-A-Box. <laughs> well, Forrest Gerlach. Uh, excuse me, it. have to? Get to. <laughs> you do, you, heard do you think all these games, do you think Whack-A-Box will be in the Gold Saucer? God, in a I future so. version? I am not done whacking boxes, my friend. <laughs> Forrest Gerlach loves it. I love that idea of playing Whack-A-Box, getting those Moogle medals, and then seeing what you can buy. And you can buy, like, ethers. I'm like, what maniac is buying ethers with their Moogle medals? <laughs> <laughs> Poor form. Uh, but he's been doing it a lot and grinding and getting a lot of stuff. I didn't get that, um, those, like, secret books or whatever. What are those? It gives you, you five or ten SP. I forget. Yeah. So it's like a... I think it's like two levels worth of um, points to put in your weapons. Okay, gotcha. Super worth it. Yeah, we had some people write in saying they keep forgetting about SP, and then they go in their menu and they're like, oh my god, now I'm just overpowered mm -hmm. all of a sudden. I definitely had a few of those moments early on. Darren says, why is no one concerned about that guy groaning like a zombie and dressed like an evil mage? Is just He's just walking around the town and around the children. 
The guy, with fine. The, the guy with the tattoo just walks through the kid's hideout and Clouds and Aerith just let him go. Why is no one concerned about this freak? It's just Marco's brother, Narco. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Narco. <laughs> Narco. <laughs> Polo. Uh, Connor says, all right. As the person who was roasted for not being into the Super Game last week, I got to say I'm coming around on it a bit more. I think a lot of the design decisions are clunky. I'm looking at you, Sunlamps. But the more I play, the more the world of Midgar is winning me over. Slowly coming up on lots of plant life for the first time in the game was a really breathtaking moment, and seeing Aerith's house made me appreciate the beauty in the game world that up until that point was a little bit bland. I'm still waiting um, for gameplay elements to click, but the atmosphere really wowed me. I had a I had a note on her house in particular. Yeah. What? How did they get that house in the slums? <laughs> they are li- they are living large down there. That it's freaking the same thing that I it's freaking it's like, beautiful. Well, well, even for those platies over there, you got the best real estate in the entire city. You got your own <laughs> yeah. waterfall, whatever. It, like, Three-story house with an observatory? Like, what is this? Stuff they have. Yeah, I was it's thinking. It's like, yeah, we live in the slum. Boo, stinky. Don't come here. Yeah. Life is hard down here in my flower garden. If I lived in the slums, I'd be like, all right, everybody, we're taking that house tonight. <laughs> just like get the pitchforks and torches and just every day try and kick down that f***ing door. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had another note on that, too. Yeah. Um, they mention their past with the Turks, and it seems like they have an interesting relationship with the Turks there. Yes. Do you think... She- do you think Shinra is helping them out in a way? Is that how they're able to afford this penthouse of the slums? I love that theory because I do like that little moment where it's like, Aerith is, she's always like, ah, oh, Turks, what do you want? You know, but she's never like, oh, they're evil. And there's mm-hmm. even a moment then where Elmira's talking to Aerith and she's like, oh, Rude swung by earlier today, just so you know. Um, I like that idea. I don't think so. I think it's just, they maybe they found a spot in the slums that wasn't special, but because Aerith likes flowers has a special thing with flowers like she was able to cultivate that area more so that it looks incredible i mean other people are living in a lean-to shack (laughs) (laughs) made made out of rusted metal (laughs) and sucking on the rusted metal for lunch (laughs) Ooh, sweet sweet rusty sustenance here (laughs) uh bo bakken is with that point hang on ronnie's either very serious or he froze (laughs) (laughs) Are our jokes not working on you? <laughs> God, he's so stern. <laughs> uh, we'll wait for him to come back, I guess. He was fingering his phone there for a second. I'm guessing he popped out. Oh, no. <laughs> he's back. Oh, my God. This is incredible. I'm back. He's, okay. Ronnie's back, everybody. Uh, Ron, we were uh, talking about Aerith House still, and uh, Bo Bakken had a similar thought to you, Grant, where he says, Anyone have any creative fan fiction describing what Aerith's mom's career is to afford a beautiful home and estate within a hundred feet of everybody else living in tin shanties? <laughs> also, can somebody build a replica of Aerith's house in the real world and put it up on Airbnb? Because it's totes cozy. Adam Moran says uh, that he thought it was incredibly thoughtfully decorated. It is stunning. Like, I realized I've been struggling in Animal Crossing about, like, I don't know what design I want to go for my home. And then I got to Aerith's house in Final Fantasy VII Remake. I'm like... Well, I just have to make Aerith's house in Animal Crossing now because there's there's no other house in my mind. This is number one house. Uh, complete with all the bullshit they leave in the hallways at night. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. I can't think of any other way to treat it. Um, right. Perfect. Yeah, people talk about like they really like the uh, kind of build up of vegetation. A couple people wrote in about that one. And uh, that was Nick Reed. And then MR Hipshot says, I really appreciate how Final Fantasy VII Remake handles sections where someone would normally think, oh, great, I have to do this now. My main example being the stealth section leaving Aerith's house. I ran into the damn bucket twice in a row because precise moments or movements isn't in Cloud's wheelhouse. Just as my blood was beginning to boil on the third attempt, the bucket and a few of the other items weren't in the way anymore. And I thought, hey, thanks, game. There are a couple more moments where an unusual gameplay moment gets easier the more times you fail. And I really appreciated that. Uh, yeah, um, this game's trying to be convenient for everybody. So the the first time I played it, uh, I also had to go on easy mode because they removed the buckets for me because I was I was struggling pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then after I had to delete the game and reinstall everything and reformat my PS4. And that's because you're PS4, uh, right? Not the game? Yes. Okay. Uh, I tried my absolute hardest to sneak through there. 
I desperately wanted like a ninja trophy or something uh, because I hit nothing. I was like inching him along. Nothing. No fanfare. No reward. Nothing. The game. Wait, there's not a trophy for it. No. Oh no. Wait, this game's bad, you guys. Yeah. Uh, it went from ten out of ten to one out of ten in that moment for me. <laughs> I understand. Me. I understand. Cut this now. <laughs> <laughs> Nate McClellan says also the language of the flowers discovery mission is one of the most touching character moments with cloud telling the flowers slash himself to learn to talk to her and then Aerith right. telling and then telling Aerith, good job today guys uh that scene got me choked up uh yeah that scene was incredible uh and it is that weird thing of like oh she just ran quickly over to go talk to the flowers i'm like oh is this gonna be a dopey scene and then when cloud just says learn to talk to her that was like oh it's amazing yeah, that, was, that was very good yeah uh, oh, also in uh, this section when you fight Rude, uh, I also like that moment too where Eris like, Cloud's pretty strong, isn't he? And Rude's like, I've seen his type before. It was a really fun little cheeky nod. Uh, Brian W. says, I can honestly say I've never been so glad to see a game character in all my life as when Aerith came out of that alleyway after I snuck out of her house. I really like that close-up camera they use for her when she talks to you at key moments. The lens and the framing they really use make her character feel like she's right in front of you. It feels like there's a subtle tracking on her face that gives the camera a slight unnatural motion, yet somehow it feels stable and real. Interesting. Um, yeah, well, it also kind of feels like it, like almost like uncomfortably close and invasive. And like, I feel like that's meant to like represent like how Cloud's interpretation hmm. of her is. Like, yeah. She's always looking for opportunities to like close that gap with, uh, with Cloud. And you even see it physically like when they're on the playground where he sits down and she looks at him kind of frustrated. And it's just like, okay, fine. And then she scoots over and he's like, okay, well, I guess we're doing this. So she's, she's always trying to like close that gap between like, you know, the physical proximity between those two. Okay. Here's a, here's a tough question. Without yeah. spoiling anything, what percentage of that is Aerith just has a crush on Cloud versus like bigger picture stuff? Um, I, I think right now it, it's, I, like I, I'm sure in this game, or maybe in the next, I guess now. Um, I mean, there's going to be like a, a moment where Aerith is probably like, I don't know if she's completely aware of why she's so connected to Cloud, but but she is. Um, and so I think she's just kind of like following her instincts. I don't think it's like this point, like methodical or intel intellectualized thing for her. I think yeah. it's just like a natural thing that she's gravitating to. And she's not sure why. Okay. James Knight says, I never played the original, but I have seen Advent Children. <laughs> After decades of friends talking about this game, I was prepared to be disappointed, particularly by Aerith. And then chapter eight rolled over me like a church. But the specific moment I was won over was after that lonely night walk through the slums, banished by Aerith's mother. It bummed me out that I wouldn't be doing more quests with Aerith. Imagine my relief when she popped out from the side of the tunnel at the edge town, explaining, I'm not sick of you yet. I was surprised at how happy I was to have her to have more time with her. Uh, and Vincent Baker says, I'm loving this game. Aerith is lovely. And the walk with her was definitely one of my favorite moments. My name is Dan also is talking about like the music is incredible. And the moment just felt precious. Like that walk with Aerith in particular, after she comes back in and you're like talking about, I think the history of wall market a little bit, but just like that nighttime walk is just incredible. Yeah. It's tr it struck me as a little odd that um, after you sneak out of the house and Aerith's mom tells you, you know, she's been waiting up for you to leave and tells you, get the hell out of here, don't come back. Yeah. Cloud has almost no reaction to Aerith <laughs> popping out of a, a rust bucket to rejoin him. Like, But it's so tough with Cloud because there's so many situations where it's like, yeah, react, you idiot. And then it's like, well, he's a flawed person. So like, it's like there's so many areas where you don't know how much you can blame the game versus just when your character is this chaotic subtle weirdo like cloud it's tough right yeah uh, yeah but i also i totally agree with you grant where like i i thought there was going to be this moment of like i just told your mom i would never talk to you again and now we you, would think you are so. i don't know what to do here but instead his response is like okay well let's let's go <laughs> yeah yeah you know that, that did feel a little disconnected to me uh derek hellman says i think chapter nine and wall market overall hang on i need to make sure Somebody, okay, Jason no, you Kelly. You right, it's mall market. What's that? I, I, I thought you said mall market there. 
<laughs> so in mall market, the cool part is uh, no. So Jason Kelly uh, says clouds tear at the beginning of chapter nine when Aerith catches him leaving on his own broke me. Something about yeah. Cloud not understanding why he suddenly fell that way. That is it, baby. Like that shot of Aerith walking off into the distance and then Cloud getting his little glitch. And then I couldn't tell if the tear was coming back with him, you know what I mean? Or like if it was just in that glitch. Or was it also on his cheek after he kind of refocused? No, I mean it was it was within the present moment. Okay. Uh that I think was the most emotional I was during this section. Like that part slayed me. They uh, are just, and, and think about like the emotional weight behind just that whole circumstance. And just a flash of that brings up that emotion. Yes. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Yes. And I mean, did you also read into that shot of it's like Aerith kind of walking away? Okay. Oh, just amazing. Yeah. Jeff, um, did you care? Uh, I, I didn't know what was going on. Yeah, it, it was it was another one of those. Mm, this is weird, intriguing. <laughs> and and again, you're not annoyed by these nods because no, they're all it's, over you know the place. it's it's fine. It's it's building a mystery, but I forget about those moments m- much quicker. Obviously, okay. And, and so and so there's not a there's not a huge impact from it, negative or positive. I'm I'm not thinking like. Oh, you know, like I've I've heard so many people say like, oh, they're building on this too much too early or whatever. Yeah. And if it's your first time, it it doesn't seem anywhere out of the ordinary. It does seem like um, just like Ben so aptly um, named glitches that they're, uh, you know, in, in this in the spot of, of like they're not too common. You know, it, it's not like you're inundated with all this just like ooh, foreshadowing all the time. Yeah. Like, like I feel like it's it's few and far between that even like people that do know what's going on like they're still very special moments and if you don't know it's kind of this cool little look where you can kind of sit there and think about like what this might mean or you can ignore it and still like not be bothered by it Mm -hmm. yeah for sure uh chris bartlett it says did anyone else think chapter nine was a little bit too long which is interesting because somebody replied to him and they're like well i mean by what measure? It's a chapter in Final Fantasy VII Remake. It's like, it, it's right. not holding anything. But in my mind, it's like, well, the first couple chapters were one hour each. So if you're going by that measure, then it does get confusing. I agree. Derek Hellman says, I think chapter nine in Wall Market overall may be one of my favorite start to finish sequences in gaming. The music alone in this section is so well done. It feels like they gave one song each to a bunch of different artists in different genres, but still somehow made it all feel like it belonged. Some of my favorite uh, quotes in this game so far are the big thug that uh, the three goons recruit, and they call him a brick house, and the nail bats (laughs) description, which is, quote, designed to beat the living tar out of anything and everything. (laughs) Yeah, the, uh, the big grunt that they hire for that side quest there. It's very Game of Thrones. It's like the mountain, right? Is what they're going for. Where it's like just his kind of weird discolored eyes through the hole. And he's just like this unstoppable force. Now, wait, hang on a second. Wait, where is that? Yeah, what the hell are you talking about? I didn't get this. What? Oh, so what are you about? your three uh, beloved goons. Oh, why can I not remember their name? Geet, oh, Sleep, and Reed? Bex, those Bex those Bex clowns. Yeah. Mad Max people. Yes, the Mad Max people who are struggling with the English language. There's a side quest where you run out and fight them and then they have like this big goon that they hired and he like grabs you and holds you did you get this no No, i i I had two interactions with them first one was with um him and Aerith. yeah and then the other one was in the arena but other than that we Ah. we didn't have a likewise interesting yeah it's it's there um Hmm. i swear uh jesse spencer Uh, so you didn't finish the johnny stuff and we didn't get them yeah this doesn't make any sense what's going on here i don't know man um, it just, no, you know, just... it would be very frustrating because you're fighting this guy and he'll just grab you and like hold you up by the throat and then they'll just like wail on you and you can lose all your health and you can't do anything. That's another frustration with combat is I found there's so many situations where I'm just kind of like stunned and then I just cannot do a single thing as I just watch my health completely deteriorate. Hmm. Uh, oh, just jump back for a second too. There's a moment in the rude fight, which blew my damn mind where it's not like a story moment as far as I can tell, but it's all natural and in the combat where Aerith is like attacking him and then he grabs Aerith's staff, like twists her around and like pops her in the back of the head and it does like 400 damage and she like stumbles away. And I think that might 
trigger then like a little story moment within the fight, but just like it is so smooth and natural. And I've never seen mm. an enemy in a game like this just grab a weapon, like, give me that, you idiot. And having like these physical interactions like that are just incredible. Like um, like like almost like this non-lethal sort of like yeah. admonishment that that because like there's that weird sort of storyline that is in the original that I'm still kind of confused by, which is like Aerith's relationship with the Turks. Like it seems like it's this ongoing thing. But at the same time, like we're acknowledging that they're like kind of very dangerous people. They're yeah, they're evil people doing evil deeds. I guess I mean they haven't said the word the oh. Turks yet, have they? Just uh Jesse. Uh Jeffum? Yeah, they've called them the yeah, Turks, right? Have they? Okay. Yeah. I don't know if that was still a mystery oh, about who these yeah, people but, are. But I think there's also a point where where Aerith says either I I think it's about Ruth that like he's he's not that bad of a guy. You yeah. Know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I always take it as it's kind of like this I they like Aerith and they just are keeping their eye on her, but because they're keeping their eye on her, they naturally love her you know and not in a romantic way but i think that's how it is right it, yeah i think right. they first i think they first called them turks when you're jumping across the rooftops <clears throat> after the church and she asked if they're looking for potential soldier candidates I yes think. right yeah that's right oh i do love too in that scene in the church when reno and cloud are talking and he's like, oh, you're in soldier, huh? Which class? And Cloud's like, first. And then Reno's like, okay, buddy. Like, if you're going to lie, try and make it believable, but come on. Yeah. Um, anyways, then back you to- you his ass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jesse Spencer says, I've grown a little frustrated with the artificial slowdown that comes with Cloud exploring towns. Whenever I'm speaking, specifically I'm speaking about chapter nine, but there are numerous instances throughout the game. Whenever Cloud walks in and out of a building or has to venture into an alley of sorts, he slows down as if he's walking in mud. I appreciate how detail- how detailed the game is, but I hate that I'm pressing run with R2 and Cloud does not respond. Mm. And Nick Brewer is saying, why are there so many tight spots in this game? Yeah, it is because of loading. There's so much detail. You need, you need to load a game at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would imagine it, it, it is that, you know, that circumstance that um, that other game has a lot. Yeah, it's the classic Gears of War. Uncharted. Right, right. It's the classic Gears of War walk and talk in a lot of these situations, though. Uh, ben Taylor says, as a first timer with Final Fantasy, I feel like we spend a lot of time ramping up with Aerith. Too much? I enjoyed the variety of party configurations through Chapter 7, but 8 and 9 are so long, and it's just Cloud and Aerith the whole time. That's 8 of my 18 total hours played. Um, yeah. I definitely have that feeling. It's such a weird thing. I feel like this way a lot with RPGs of just, when does the game start? When can I get serious about really mapping out my materia making the most of this situation. And I feel like I need three party members before I can really do that. And so I feel like I've been kind of, I know I'm so far into this game, but I still feel like, okay, when is the actual, now I get to sit down, choose my party members, choose the materia, make the most out of it instead of kind of strategically kind of has, half-assing it at this point, you know? Yeah, I, I, I wonder if it is that kind of game. Honestly. I think uh, part two. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, I'll look forward to that. Uh, Rob Hudak says it's worth pointing out that the date outfit que uh, question that Tifa asks you about in the earliest chapter determines what dress she wears to Don Corneo. I chose something exotic and saw Tifa sporting a beautiful and tasteful black silk kimono. What dresses did you all end up with? It's like a blue purpley thing. Yeah. I chose right. erotic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, beating down Brian is specific to mention uh my favorite thing he says in mall market there's a dead end path just to the right of don corneo's place this leads down to the stone wall with graffiti where you exit wall market in the original game ben will be glad to know that the graffiti there now reads avalanche instead of Averil. yes yep. i have a I have one note that just says wall now says avalanche how happy is ben question mark. <laughs> very <laughs> very pleased by that although i remember in last week uh, in the episode I talked about if the graffiti looks the same. And I did a comparison at least of uh, the graffiti style that's on the poster for Avalanche. And that is different. So it's tricky. Uh, Sutton says, anyone else disappointed that you couldn't play darts at the Drunkard's Den in Wall Market? There are two dartboards on the wall right in the clothing store, right next to the clothing store owner. Why even have them in there if we can't have the same dart game? Yeah, you're right. Tough, tough world, Sutton. Uh, Jamie Lee Tardis says, the man at Drunkard's uh tavern heroically waiting in line to pee really wet my whistle 
good. I'm glad you like him. Sorry, what? <laughs> uh, not, not the greatest metaphor to go. Jamie go with Lee there. Turtis <laughs> liked the man holding his pee pee. <laughs> and their name is yeah. Jamie Lee Turtis. <laughs> uh, Dennis M says you get more and more. F- oh, okay. Let's let you want to do a little Johnny mop up. Oh, no, Johnny. Willie Aguilar says, I joined the Patreon just so I could rag on Johnny. Did anyone else hate him as much as I did? I wanted to punch him by the end of Chapter 9. He's such an annoying character. I didn't like that Cloud didn't remember him. That bothered me. Maybe he's just trying to move on with his life. He doesn't want to acknowledge that previous confusing life he had in Sector 7. Yeah. When he almost murdered him. (laughs) Yeah. All the day's work. Wanted to take his life, but doesn't remember him. Daniel Willett Pine says, I think Johnny is indicative of the entire remake. From one conversation with an NPC in the original to a ridiculous over-the-top character. Do I love him? Yes, but I also love Rose. Rose, Rose, Rose. Uh, Wall Market (laughs) really retained the tonal whiplash that the original had. Uh, And Andrew Valla says, Johnny's glee as he yelled, we're going to see some weird shit tonight, (laughs) is when I finally gave in and really liked this damn goofball. (laughs) Uh, I mean... If I'm going to have to choose between a Roche or Johnny, I'm, I'm going Johnny all day. <laughs> Johnny has thrown his phone off the table. Sorry, I just tried to hit you. At least, at least Johnny abides to the laws of physics, unlike Roche. All right, buddy. All right. Uh, Dennis M. has a point that we'll get to after Adam Marin, who wrote, The Wall Market Tournament was far more enjoyable than I expected. The waiting music was tight. The announcers were yeah. pretty funny and commented on specific abilities you'd make. I cheered when Beck's badasses were announced as opponents. And having the Hell House take center stage, despite being one of the weirdest Final Fantasy enemies, was a nice touch. And then Adam sums it all up with his final sentence. Own that weirdness, Square. <laughs> Hell, <laughs> um, yes. What an odd story for the Hell House. <laughs> to, to go from... A remembered but easily beaten enemy <laughs> yes. in the original to this freaking behemoth house. What the f*** was that? I here's the thing, like, um, Jeff, I, I don't know, like, if you know anything of like the the deep and story <laughs> lore of the Hell House. For audio <laughs> no. listeners, he's nodding aggressively. <laughs> but but I mean, like, just how minuscule this whole thing is. It's like <laughs> at that part in um in the original Final Fantasy VII. When you know you're, you're traveling to Wall Market, and there's the um, like like the place with the hands, there's just an enemy that's a house that after you do a certain amount of damage on, it turns into like a little bit more of a beast, and it's you know it, it's it's a difficult enemy comparatively to the other things that you're fighting, but not like hard in in any sense that you would be like oh crap like the no. hell is here easily beatable e- easily beatable. But I mean, like, it's a memorable just monster mm-hmm. that, like, if you're a fan, like, you remember the Hell House. But that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Like, you might raise an eyebrow, like, hmm, what's the house doing here? Yeah. But I did, however, in that in that time in the Final Fantasy VII remake, where the the you were do, you doing the hands, the, the 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 very complex hand puzzles, I did know, like, I'm like. The house is gonna be around here somewhere. Absolutely, like, I did have mm. that thought. I thought it was Aerith's house, and I was <laughs> to that like that the Hell House didn't make an appearance, and That's so funny. you can just picture my glee. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it was so exciting when, when uh, it finally popped up. Yeah, but that the just the again uh, the production values that go into this, just yes. the, the entire tournament. And and the yeah. announcers every single round and just all the different camera shots and everything was crazy for that kind for what essentially was okay we're gonna throw three you know three fights at you now yes right. absolutely yeah. uh, Colin um, Malovlich uh, overall he's just talking about the this entire thing chapter nine the Corneo Coliseum he says hats off to the Final Fantasy VII team and Keenan Harrell says one of my favorite gaming moments of the year has to be the Hell House boss in the Coliseum. <laughs> Hell House is one of the strangest enemies in the original and the one enemy I was questioning if it would make the cut for remake. Not only did they incorporate it, but they made it a huge, spectacular boss fight. It felt like an inside joke between the developers and longtime fans 
And this is it, Keenan. He says, I will no longer question Square's dedication to the weirdness of the original game. Mm. Right. And that is like and, the and, bigger and, picture that's just like so satisfying to see Square embrace the tone of Final Fantasy VII, not try and advent children put a like right. gloss of cool over everything. It's just acknowledging that this is a weird, funny world. And that's and that like goes that speaks directly to the core of my anxiety about the future of this game is that like it it hits it so on the nose that I just wonder like where they're going to go from here and if if they can keep that up and it's it, it's a constant sort of like as I'm playing this game of like they can't keep doing this yeah like, <laughs> I mean like, if if the treatment of the hell house wasn't enough to like calm <laughs> calm your nerves uh <laughs> I don't know it, what it else you need at this point. Well, here's the thing: is it, it's like I, I have full faith and confidence that the rest of this game is going to be uh, on on par with what we've seen so far. I'm talking about more about like the, the like the follow up games and like who's directing them, who's writing them, who's developing them, and like I, I don't know. Like that's where my fear is. Given the critical success and the fanfare around this, I mean, clearly they can see that people want this level of detail. Yeah, uh, I. I don't think that they're going to drop the ball moving forward because this has to be making just a ton of money right now, too. I think they've announced that it sold 3.5 million, which maybe I was expecting more. I, I, that, that to me seems like not the highest number. It's good, no doubt. But like I looked it, it's up. It's good, yeah. No, it's, it's great. But I mean, like, ugh, considering that, like, there's just kind of this. Uh, no other competition out there right now. Well, also remember, um, it's think about how much it's cutting into the physical versions that you know people walking by and seeing Final Fantasy VII on a shelf at Wall Market that doesn't. Uh, sorry, Walmart. <laughs> that Walmart. It doesn't, it doesn't really exist. Lovers. You know. Yeah. Um. You want to turn down the audio just a little bit more on your phone there, Ronnie? Just really turn it down. Yes. Yeah, so that yeah. So we're quieter for you because we're hearing our own echo. Why are you so pissy about this? <laughs> you look so annoyed by this. <laughs> well, we, uh, we just had this conversation. You're like, oh, there's no echo. Yeah, I know. Uh, Jason Bristol says, we got to talk about the Hell House. Not only was this totally unexpected for me, but it also became the turning point for most players on how good they were at managing materia, reading enemy patterns, and overall just staying alive long enough to make it through. I kept beating my head against the way the first few times until I took a break and breath and started strategizing and attacking when it shifted its magic. Overall, I think this fight might be too long, but it made me a better fighter. And the Coliseum is such a great part of this game. I hope this factored in a, in some way in each part going forward. Maybe like Gold Saucer can have the arena and Wutai can have another arena. Also hearing the fanfare was fantastic. Um, yeah, this fight was, I, I'm not exaggerating. I have the footage. I think it was close to an hour for me. I was going to wow. say the same. Yeah, it, it was probably, probably around 45 minutes for me. Because I lost, went back, equipped the best material that I thought I could. I clearly was not making the most of it. And then just got suckered into it. And then just got my ass kicked. And I didn't have Shiva. Uh, so I had Ifrit jump out there, which did Nothing. squat all. Nothing. Um, and then it was just oh. a matter of trying to get to that barrier over and over and over again. And it was just brutal. Because like, all right, Cloud has the wind material. Aerith up. has Blazaga. I guess I'll keep going with that, and it just took forever. I think I got lucky timing because it was on a it was on a vulnerability to fire when I got Ifrit out. Um, oh, amazing! Yeah. <laughs> what are you scoffing yeah, at? No, I, I, I had the the worst material equipped. I had I had wind and um, wind and lightning, and during my playthrough, um, it was almost always fire, either possessing fire or possessing wind. And that's it. And sucking you in through the door. And it's like, okay, well, the one that I had um, lightning materia equipped on is now being sucked into the house. So <laughs> I can't yeah. do anything. Yep. I was so infuriated. But that soundtrack is unbelievable. Crypto Zookeeper has something for you, Jeff. I'm saying that the Hell House ruled so much and the boss gave me major Chrono Trigger vibes in the second phase. Or it switch elements you'd have to adjust on the fly based on minor visual cues. Yeah, I, oh, I, I wish I could have taken advantage of that more, except I only had ice attacks on me and so i couldn't do anything when it when it would switch to something else which which seemed like 75 percent of the time it was 
like I had so many, so few windows. It also took me like 40 minutes just because I was doing such a little damage along the way. Uh, but I, I still really like that, that yeah. fight. It was just, so, I, I wish I could have taken advantage, you know, been able to switch. And I just, I just wish you could adjust your materia after a fight starts because yeah. there's just no way knowing going into it what yeah. you're gonna what you're gonna need yeah. yeah and i refuse to just like well i guess i could die because mm-hmm. i haven't lost yet in the game and so like i, I don't want it to be this just like on ceremonies like well i just need better material so m- instead i just gotta grind it out for 45 minutes and it was just like it would go into that god mode and yeah. i would read this as, as i used to assess on it twice because i'm like none of this makes any sense and i i, I like it's no, like, there's an opportunity oh, to stagger the after mode. the god mode. It's very clear. It's like, <laughs> like where yeah, is it's it? Like, it's vulnerable for a brief moment, and then you can uh, stagger it then. And so I tried everything to like ex- expose that moment, like when it's just getting out of god mode, and everything just seemed to either bounce off. Like Aerith was pretty effective. Cloud was completely useless in that fight. Yeah. For me. Yep, even like Aerith's basic attack, the fact that, okay, that's getting through. I'm doing 48 damage. Now, how much does right. he have? And then I would cast Blizzaga. He would change his form to ice, and then I'd heal him for a 1,000, right, when he was about to die. And I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. All right, I guess I'll bang on his wall more with Cloud and hope that this barrier is down at just the right moment so I can use and my limit break. One damage. Yeah, it was insane. Yeah, um, yeah uh, the anonymous developer who wrote in also was furious about the Hell House. Um, he said he was really angry about Dodging, not having iframes. I hear you. Um, Beaten Down Brian has a good overall th- thought here, saying, I absolutely love how epic the boss fights feel. They really set the tone with the first fight with the Scorpion, and part of me wondered if they could keep up the intensity from there, but they have surpassed it. Every big fight that's followed has been great. The new Crab boss, the Airbuster, Reno, Shiva, Rude, the Fat Chocobo, in particular Hell House, were all fights that blew me away, not only as a spectacle, but with an interesting mechanic to boot. I really enjoyed these times when it felt like the game was pushing back, forcing me to pay attention and use the tools at my disposal. Yes, great point. They are all incredible so far. Also, I really like that moment where I think it's in the Mako Reactor 5 after you beat the boss, not the Airbuster, but the one before that. And then... The the little grab boss? Yeah. And then Barrett has some line where he's like, yeah, the first boss we fought was a scorpion. I don't yeah. know what this one was supposed to be. <laughs> All right, moving <laughs> on. I was just confused about what the hell that was. What's, uh, like, like Jeff, what's your favorite fight so far? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know that I can, I don't know that I can pick one. They've, they've just all been so entertaining. Right. I'm trying yeah. to remember a crab boss. It's like what the hell's bl- the crab? It's like blue. It's barely a it, crab. It, it was like the second, the second giant oh, robot. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Right, end, yeah. end of the subway tunnels. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right. which, now. which that one was also great, and I'm and I was still just as blown away by how many different stages they have to it, and how many times they break to you know a cinematic angle to so show something right. else. Yeah. Forming yeah. off of it and everything, like they've just knocked it out of the park every time, even with yeah. the damn yeah. house. <laughs> The damned Hell House. I'm going to go as the Hell House for Halloween just so you guys know. Oh, uh, <laughs> that would be good. Fred DeNovo says the commentators during the Hell House fight commented once I summoned Ifrit talking specifically about his fire attacks and such, and I thought it was such a cool touch. Yeah, they kept yeah. screaming about, like, the attacks seem to be doing nothing at all. I know, commentators. I, I'm trying <laughs> here. Or, like, I love, you know, they had a line, too, where it's like, oh, did anybody get the number on that house? Like, I thought those commentators were... Fantastic. I thought Marlene was the best voice acting in the game, and then Koch and Scotch here just annihilated because they they feel like real WWE announcers. Like, what did I just see? Oh, that man had a family. <laughs> like real, real, real stuff there. And then mm-hmm. it turns out that they're uh, creepy uh, perverts at the <laughs> Corneo Big Mansion. Time. So it's like, ah, I guess I can't like them anymore. All right. Old Scrot and Gooch there. <laughs> the funny thing is, is, you knew that coming into the fight. I don't think <laughs> I didn't know that they were going to be like attacking gassed women. Anyways, uh, Joe Halaska says, um, "Yeah, Scotch and Crotch have been canceled." Just so you everyone's aware. <laughs> uh, Joe Halaska says, "After you defeat the Hell House in the arena in Walmart, there's a side quest with Johnny where he takes you all over town. At one point, you can walk in on him telling the pharmacist about the fight. The pharmacist incredulously responds, "Wait, your friends fought a house?" <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw that too. I really like that. That's very fun. Uh, Dennis M loves how after each fight in the Coliseum, they add more flowers outside, mm -hmm. and that you go in the room right, next yeah. to it, and there's always like the people you beat sitting in there, and then one time you go in there after. Sam and his robots are defeated, and there's also there's just a big pile of robots, and Sam's like, that cost me a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> How the hell they got him through that door? <laughs> no, it's so stupid. And why bother at that point? <laughs> uh, Sam Marsden yeah, uh, says, after winning the Coliseum battles, you can do three extra battles if you talk to the guy again. The third battle has five waves to it, and the fourth and fifth were having the Huntsman mini-boss in them, and they give you 750 XP, which means the five wave battles gives around 2000 xp the point is sam marsden just went through all those battles and he said it was the most amazing place to level up uh did anybody else do that mm -mm. no nope. no i didn't have time <laughs> yeah we were russian um and he says also it's repeatable long story short i'm now max level with all my materia and oh, wow. uh, i cannot wait for the next episode of the deepest dive that's amazing <laughs> uh nicholas freitas there's an insane amount of variation in wall market all these are factors for dresses and outcomes. Number of Chapter 8 quests complete, interacting with Johnny, massage price, gambling with Chocobo Sam, side quests with either Madam M or Chocobo Sam. Yeah, I was amazed. I loved Madam M as a character. I thought she was so funny how she's like all like, oh, sophisticated. Ooh, we'll wow you with these massages. And then she's like, I'm going to shove this fucking fan down your throat. Like she just yeah. like, <laughs> snap. And it was like, so fun. On a dime. Yes. Yes. Yeah, also, and, and she would just have this, have these moments of just pure insanity. I, I, I loved her. Like just call, like calm, cool, composed. Then you say the wrong thing and she's threatening to uh, put a fan up your rectum. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, I guess we're getting to it here, boy. Uh, Fred DeNovo says, it's wild that they didn't include the vibration during the hand massage scene. They could have just done it on the right or left side, depending on which side of the hand she was massaging. If Kojima was making this, you'd better believe that controller would rumble. <laughs> Good point. That's fair. Uh, yep. Chris Bartlett says, which hand massage did you get? I picked the luxury option while my family was watching me play, and it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was a weird one. Uh, I went, uh, I went luxury. Yeah, I think when the choices were presented, I had, uh, I had just gotten done shopping, so I had like three thousand and fifty gil. You better believe I spent that three thousand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was scraping barrel, but like I gotta do it. I gotta <laughs> I know. Had to borrow uh, two hundred gil from Eric. <laughs> uh, J Joshua Duproy says, "Did Cloud have the big O?" <laughs> yeah for sure because then he comes out and and he can't even talk to eric at the, at the end that was hilarious he's just like leaned up against the wall like well, what? what what's going on that was so he's like are you okay huh? <laughs> what well, also fun. it was so weird that like you played as Aerith during that chunk and then there's a chunk later on also where you play as Aerith when like you see cloud coming out as the dress and it's like it's so weird to have mm -hmm. these two slices just so they can have like physical humor of cloud not in a cutscene. And I think it's really smart and fun. Um, yeah. What was going on there? She's like, ooh, you like it rough? But she's just like massaging his hand and Cloud was losing his mind. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just the goofiness of Final Fantasy VII. I, I feel like that's a perfect encapsulation of just like, yeah, he's getting a hand massage and an orgasm. <laughs> I mean, everybody around the entire wall market is talking up those massages. There must be something to it. That's true. Uh, Jeff, um, um Put your hand in the air. Were you in any way aroused by the scene? <laughs> or you got the hand massage? Put your hand up. It was, it was absurd. Where'd that hand go? There was a moment of me of like, this is stupid. Okay, Square Enix trying to be sexy. And I'm like, wait, is this kind of hot? I think, I think there's something going on here. Wait, were you actually aroused, Hanson? <laughs> talking about engorged i'm talking about like <laughs> it, it was more it was sexier than i expected <laughs> okay no, i, I, I didn't it. find it sexy okay but it was just very funny <laughs> yeah i did too that was hilarious uh, anyways uh crypto zookeeper says just wanted to make sure to mention that when you talk to chadley in chapter nine as cloud wearing a dress mm. he becomes a nervous stuttery mess what a nerd <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Give me a board, Doug. Uh, <laughs> that might be the one. I did not uh, I did not do that. I did not talk to Chadley in the dress and I really regret it now. No, I didn't either. I didn't either. Yeah. No, I, I, I did. 
and it was Before. very it was everything i wanted it to be <laughs> i guess he talks about like every every time i see that kid it's like oh freaking chadley there <laughs> and, and, then when I, and then when i saw him in walmart it's like you can't be in here. I know. Like, and, and he's still just sitting there like, oh, hi, Cloud. I made another VR simulation for you. It's like, oh, go home. <laughs> but you know this. Cloud, are you still a virgin too? <laughs> <laughs> you know the second that you aren't looking at Chadley, he's off just doing the most debaucherous stuff. <laughs> oh, my God. He, you do not want to know where he puts those stingers. I just uh, need 300 gil. <laughs> Please, Chadley's good for it. Come on, Chadley. So I followed your rules pretty well, Ben, by not talking to, to Ron about this game while I'm playing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's tough. That's very tough. One of the few things I've said is that he feels like the worst version of the Resident Evil Bender follows you everywhere. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Chadley. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> what are you buying? Nothing, Chadley. Get the hell out of my face. <laughs> I think you should pay attention. He has some good stuff, Grant. You gotta, eh. you gotta feed the Chadley. Eh. It was all right at best. I genuinely had like a jump scare when I was in Wall Market, then just looked to my right and was like, oh, Chadley, like, what is he <laughs> doing here? Yeah. Did not expect that. Um, Aesir Lord Thor, oh, welcome. Welcome to the podcast, Aesir Lord Thor. Says, my favorite part of this little chunk was definitely everyone in Wall Market reacting to Cloud in address. It's interesting how it has you take control of Aerith just for a bit to see it from a different perspective. Um, and then he says, how did Don Corneo not realize that Cloud's voice is a man? He doesn't even try to hide it once <laughs> we're in the bedroom. Look, he's a cartoon wolf. He's just, he's yeah. not, he's not yeah. a thing. Oh my God, that's, that, that's, that's the perfect way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Well. Wolf. Uh, Seth Walker says, I adored how thirsty Aerith was while she watched Cloud get made over on stage. <laughs> It's so perfectly <laughs> Japanese, and I love it. And then Andrew Valla says, oh, my God, yes. She was, like, hyperventilating, and I died. <laughs> that was hilarious. It is so I, funny. Uh, that, that's, that dance sequence was top ten favorite moments in gaming. For me. <laughs> <laughs> what about it? What, what, what struck you? It what was a... absurd and <laughs> hilarious the entire time. Yeah, I, I was missing button prompts just because I yes. was a god <laughs> at what was going on. It is unbelievable. Yeah, uh, Scott Castro says, as someone who considers himself rather adept at rhythm games, I was embarrassed at how mediocre I was at the honeybee dance sequence. This is mostly due to the fact that I kept pressing square when I meant X because he's an Xbox gamer. But yeah, I was also missing button prompts. Like, well, it doesn't really matter. And then if you miss the button prompt, you get... What Aaron Carmichael points out, which is the moment Aerith cringe laughed at my bad rhythm game skills, I think I fell head over heels in love with this game. I was in, baby. <laughs> Did you all get that, that laughter one, from Aerith? Like if you're doing well, she just like claps. It's like, oh my God. She's into it. Yeah. But did you ever get her like mixed reaction? No, no, no. I didn't. It is so funny. I'll send it to you in Slack. It is amazing. Is her just like, oh, huh. Hey, oh, like it's like the funniest <laughs> thing I've seen in the game. Um, uh, the part that struck me so much, I mean, aside from just the entire absurdity of it, yeah. Um, when you're practicing your your moves in the dressing room, and you're like using your sword as like a dance routine kind of thing, yeah. Holy shit! Did they turn that on his head? And you're now like Lord of the Dance when you get on stage. I know Just because like, yes, during that sequence, I'm like, okay, well, it makes sense. They'll couch it. Uh, it's like, okay, Cloud's gonna do his combat moves, and it'll kind of look like dancing. And then it is just he all goes for it. Out. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Barrett Boswell I, so, so says so. Based on Cloud's dance performance, can we conclude that when he first came to Midgar, he started as a honey boy because his moves were perfectly <laughs> in sync? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, big time yeah, honey I boy. Just, uh, that was like, what's what's the name of that game? That's um, oh about Yakuza, Yakuza. Dance Yakuza. Dance Revolution. Yeah, like that, that's what I, that's like kind of what I imagined Yakuza to be. Like in that same sort of vein of just like two completely different things enmeshed into one. Yes, uh, Jason Bristol says, "Hey, can we just call the game like it is?" In the fact that it's a very good Yakuza RPG, I wonder how Yakuza Seven will feel. Uh, as people have it as a more traditional turn-based style compared to this, the similarities between these two series is amazing with the ridiculous story, amazing characters, wacky side quests, detailed city hubs. Um, a lot of people brought that up. And it seems like Square, there's no way that they were not taking inspiration from some of those karaoke and other sequences in Yakuza and just going as over the top as possible for like, all right, Sega, what you do over there is cute, but here's like hundreds of millions of dollars thrown at a Yakuza <laughs> game. It is amazing. And it shows. It shows. Uh, shows. 
I, I really like too that after you're done with this, I mean, Jeff, the dance sequence was not in the original, in case you're wondering. Okay. Uh, and when you're done with this whole thing, uh, they give a message too of like the equality part of it too. It's like they take this this crazy dance sequence, but then give it like a positive spin too. That was, yes. that was really nice. Yes, absolutely. So Nick uh, says, I was very nervous about how the game would handle the dress scene and was really thrilled to see it portrayed in chapter nine as fun and joyful. The other characters make it clear. It's not just okay for Cloud to wear a dress, but it's okay for him to look good in it. There's even a line too, I think, where Aerith is like, you know you like this stuff. Uh, <laughs> and Brian Regal says, the biggest moment I think for this section is the Honeybee Inn and the not so subtle message from Andrea. Uh, it says, uh, Brian says, although I'm not transgender or gender fluid, I appreciated the message. And I think it was just uh, Andrea saying like, you know, beauty does not know gender. It's born from within, that type of thing. And then he's like, don't be right. afraid, Cloud. It's so sweet. Uh, Emma yeah, writes in and she's, she says, I love the entire cloud cross-dressing sequence. I remember thinking years ago that they'd cut it or really downplay it, but instead they kept it in and dialed it up to 11. That's starting... a great point. Yes. Like they, it would have been so easy to just be like, nah, that didn't happen. We're, we're going to, we're going to blaze right over this, but to go the complete opposite direction where it's just like, we're going to embrace this and we're just going to give it steroids as well. Like, yes insane it's so impressive uh travis manic oh has something unrelated but yeah i i absolutely adored that sequence and i haven't like read about you know how like the queer community is taking to that scene overall i sure right yep. like a couple i've heard like a couple comments here and there but i am curious to hear more of that take um travis manic says corneo's big belly has extremely dead or alive level jiggle physics <laughs> And the I did fact, notice that. Although the fact that they didn't use it on other uh, uh, reputable character assets is surprising for how horny this game is at times. I'm looking at you, Madam M. Uh, yeah, I guess that's a decent point. Um, Jeffum, what did you make of the very end of Chapter 9? Not Corneo hitting the lever and he talks about evil monologues and now he's a villain and all that stuff, but like that scene in the Shinra headquarters. In the Shinra. Do you recall this? Did it have an impact on you? It was um, um you remember like the it was the president in his um in his office and he was talking to Heidegger and a and a new guy who he was he was kind of expressing doubt about this plan coming up. Do you remember that? Do you remember that, Jeff? <laughs> uh not well enough, apparently. <laughs> okay, yeah. So it is it's them talking about well, Corneo reveals that he's working with Heidegger and they're planning on dropping the plate on sector seven. And so right, there's right. a guy named Reeve who's fun to see. Uh, and in that scene saying like, you guys are nuts. There's 50,000 people down there. And right. Right. Like you got to lighten up a little bit, buddy. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 okay. Oh. Yeah, Heidegger yeah. had a point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was, it's interesting that, I don't know that that scene is like, Oh, they're really leaning into this plate stuff in a way I didn't really expect in the remake. Talking about like, you know, the history with, with Sector 6 and the plate falling and them talking about like, we're planning on dropping this plate, I think is, is interesting for the remake here. Oh. <laughs> is that okay? No, oh, that's fine. <laughs> All right. Um, Adam <laughs> Dominguez. Woo, we're getting near the end, everybody. Adam Dominguez says, what's the greatest change you've made to the default settings? I cannot stand how drowned out the music has been, so I set the volume for voice at four, sound effects to five, and crank that sweet music to ten. I uh, I took a note from the last discussion and turned off chat logs, and it's great. Just so when you're wandering around town, the screen isn't filled with mm. all those things that you can just hear. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I haven't made many, if any, changes. I haven't changed a thing. Yeah. Uh, Justin Hughes says something cool I noticed first on the bus restored but confirmed when I got the hard edge if the weapon has grouped materia slots for the support materia the slots on the weapon have a line connecting them oh I love cool. that wow. Edgar Vasquez has a killer question why is soldier capitalized <laughs> well soldier it, it is interesting it's an acronym that, <laughs> yeah, I guess it's an acronym it's no, I don't know it um but in the original, and even in parts of this game, they say, oh, you were in Soldier? You were in Soldier? And then I think it's like Elmira, and I think Aerith, they say, you were a Soldier. Which is like, oh, that's weird. Mm -hmm. Like, it, they always, I thought, referred to it just like, you were in Soldier, not you were just a Soldier. I mean, but, you can but, say but, that I, you're a Marine or you're in the Marines, like, you know. No, but it, it's, it's, it's capitalized. 
Well, I guess that's a good point. They they did the same uh, treatment with Avalanche, too. Yeah, I guess you're right. I take it all back. Uh, Chris Hodge has something I don't quite understand. He says, the Sahagens, which are an enemy type, they have a move called Jump that I believe is the same one as one of Sid's limit breaks in the original game. Just going back to that. Um... Oh, boy, you've been recording a long time. Dragoon archetype. Um, Adam Moran says that he loves the game a lot, but he's underwhelmed by the character models aside from the main characters. I really wish that the copy pacing of the Shindra troops uh, would have followed more of the Resident Evil 2 remake style where all the basic zombies had different variety and some could be female and stuff. I get it, but think about how small Resident Evil 2 is in comparison to what they're trying to make here, but I get it. I get it. Yeah, I, 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 but I do think that that's like, that is a an area where I really hope they improve. Yeah. It's like that. That's something like how janky and blocky those guys look. Like I, I hope that's something that they address in the future because it's bad. Yeah. Um, Ricky Winterbottom says the game's not perfect, but it's by far the most impressed I've been with a JRPG since the PlayStation One era. Do you think the success of this game could start a JRPG renaissance? A new Chrono game series with this level of quality could put Squeenix back on top for years. I think this is such an anomaly because of the financial yeah. success of the original game that they're willing to pour gazillions of dollars into this. Don't think that it's like, oh, now they could do this for Final Fantasy VIII. I mean, they might. If anything, I think they'd remake Ten next because I think it's their second best-selling game. I think they're going to be Probably. that yeah. analytical going forward. Yeah, and I wouldn't expect it from any other developer to try and jump in and say, hey, super high-polished, expensive RPGs are in now. We can make right. a boatload of money. If we yeah. spend a billion dollars and actually have the talent to do this, and a and an IP beloved enough that we yes. know, you know, it's guaranteed to like this is a perfect storm of things for yeah. Square and, right and, now. and again, it's it's not complete yet, I, and I mm -hmm. oh, this is so expensive. Yeah. Um, last question. Oh my god. Yeah, we've got through every community question. Uh, Caleb what? Murray. Yeah, this is unbelievable. Caleb Murray says, "How do the Minfax?" What is our name? Min Max? How do the Min crew, he oh says. He, what's the name of this thing? <laughs> How do the Min crew feel about them continuing to bring up and weave in the Wu Tai conflict stuff this early in the story? If I remember correctly, in the original, you don't even know there was a history there until you go to Wu Tai. Hang on, are you guys playing Final Fantasy VIII or Seven? What are we, <laughs> what are we doing? Um, I, yeah, the Wu Tai stuff is interesting, especially it was. When they're talking about populations of Midgar overall, then I started thinking about like, wait, these are just cities that are at war. Is that what's going on here? Like Wutai has like 17 people in it versus <laughs> Midgar's as gazillions. There's one Yuffie 25. though. Oh, I see. I see. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would imagine that, yeah, the, I mean, these are, I, I, to, to my knowledge, the only two forms of the only two government bodies in the entire world uh medeal oh medeal strong <laughs> strong Gungaga. monarchy i believe what was that right Gungaga. Gungaga. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> welcome to this point of the deepest dive where ronnie whispers town names for final Fantasy seven into the mic nibbleheem <laughs> <laughs> all right Can everybody you do it sexier <laughs> please Nibbleheim. And could you pretend to rub Jeffem's hands? All right, everybody. Thank you so uh, much. Hey, no, 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 wait. I got a small detail I love. Yes. That I wanted to bring up. I love the game clock in this stupid game. <laughs> what? Because it's it's always in the it's always in the bottom, you know. Right. But it it will automatically pause if you're on a menu for yeah. like two minutes or something. And then it kind of grays out so you know that it's not you know, when it's actually counting time and when it's not. So this way, if I do ever fall asleep, which I fall asleep during every game that I play, <laughs> I don't have to worry about the game clock being off. That's great. Oh, that's very that's helpful. Very cool. Really, how often do you fall asleep over there? I fall asleep <laughs> all the time. But not during, <laughs> I haven't fallen asleep during Final Fantasy. Yeah. So Hell yeah. keeping me awake. There we go. That's great news. High praise. Um, to every single person that submitted a comment... We bow to thee. We applaud thee. Yes. Thank you for your amazing feedback and making our experience and the world's experience, honestly, 
or everybody watching or listening to this, uh, their experience of the remake better. Like, it is so satisfying to play through a game this way, and I'm glad that a lot of you out there agree, and this might be the first deepest dive you've ever listened to from us. You're also welcome to go back and listen to us talk about uh, Chrono Trigger and Outer Worlds and even Animal Crossing, which is kind of a different format overall, talking about a living game like that. But, hey, you're a trooper if you've listened this far, a real Shinra trooper, and uh, if you enjoy this conversation... We'd always appreciate it if you help share it with a friend. If you just let another fan of Final Fantasy know that, hey, you know, the best, most thorough discussion about the Final Fantasy VII remake is happening in one place on the internet, MinMax's YouTube channel or our Patreon feed. Uh, if you are a $5 supporter, you get the podcast version, of course. Thank you to everybody. Anything else that we want to get off our chest about this section of Final Fantasy VII remake? Uh, you know, uh, um... We we left um we left a lot of stones unturned. Um, I don't know when we're gonna be able to get back to this, but uh, no, I, I I I'm just again like I'm just very excited to see what these next few chapters are and and what do we need to play? What do we need to play up to? Yes, the next chunk, chapters ten through fourteen. 10 through 14, and we'll have the post looking for your thoughts on Monday, April 27th. That's going to be on patreon.com slash minmax2ends. If you support us at any tier, you can submit a comment. So the discussion will be airing on April 29th, but chapters 10 through 14, um, and I do not have a sense of length overall, Ronnie, so let's just expect it'll be the same length as this, and then we'll be surprised along the way. Uh, please and, write in with twice as many comments as this time. Oh my god. <laughs> You'll kill me, but it's worth it for the discussion. So we hope you enjoyed this overall, and thanks again to everybody that wrote in. And, hey, we'll see you next week, right? For sure. We'll Ain't no it. getting off of this train we're on, son. Alright, and uh, Ronnie, time to close it with your classic catchphrase. Get on out of here. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> MinMax is a Patreon about games, friends, and getting better. The Deepest Dive is the best, most thorough discussions about games on the internet. Prove us wrong, please. The MinMax Show podcast airs every Thursday. Patreon supporters vote on what we stream every single week and a whole lot more. Give us a shot. Try subscribing to the YouTube channel, and we hope we can win you over. 